goes in 40 nights, doesn't it?
uh, the refit energy uh, Cymru energy performance framework that's been completed. The board briefing session was held on the 20th of April. Uh, we are arranging uh, a training session for board members. Uh, the capital program has been added to the Ford work program and, and that's scheduled for October. Um, and the smoke free legislation uh, um, will be updated with at the uh, strategy meeting in uh, September. Yeah. Uh, the annual audit report has been completed and circulated, as have the committee terms of reference and and the annual plan as well. And um, I think that's the we're also looking at uh, a, a development session around uh, planning and performance around the annual plan and what it means for staff. Yes. Yes. Louise asked particularly for a development session on that, and, and I think I completely concur with her. It's complicated and uh, and we all need to understand uh, thoroughly the, the issues in line. And, and I'm th thank Geraint for uh, arranging that for us. Thank you. Shelley? Um, yes, just it's one minor point on page 14 on the log, and I think it's in the minutes as well. There's a reference at the bottom of that to um, obviously the training that... Um, uh, which is just mentioned it's actually carbon literacy training not climate training yeah. thank you we'll make that uh, amendment thank you very much and anything else on the action log no, if not we go on to one six report on sealed documents and chairs actions richard let's check adam uh, th this time around we have uh, 13 documents which require the health board seal uh, six of these were around minor works and uh, one was a general building works program. Um, one was for uh, Abergavenny facilities for a deed of variation and one for, for a sale of uh, freehold land. Uh, we, we've also signed a lease with the Walled Garden at uh, Llanfrecfa and we're looking at the service level agreement between Torvine uh, County Borough Council and our Fly and Start Families First Early Years Service. Uh, we, we've also had three chairs actions during this period. Uh, th these are included in, in the papers. Uh, uh, there's one for an extension of uh, the registered nursing and healthcare support work bank incentives. Uh, one which supports the uh, the Grange University Hospital and the clinical futures implementation, and one which is uh, around the St Joseph's Hospital contract extension. Are you content with the chairs actions and the uh, sealed documents? Yes. Yeah. 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 And can I just note that uh, how grateful I am for the amount of detail that I get in order to be able to uh, enact chair's actions. It's uh, it's a very good audit trail and it's most reassuring to have that detail uh, before you uh, have to sign off chair's actions. So thank you very much for the teams for that. If there are no questions, we'll move on to the chair's report. Uh, this is my sort of extramural uh, activities rather than what I uh, do on a day-to-day -day basis as chair. But this is uh, just an account uh, of what I've uh, tried to cover in the last couple of months in addition to my uh, normal responsibilities for the board. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. No? Well done. <laughs> well, done. <laughs> well uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, the board's forward work program, please, Richard. Yeah, yes, Chair. Uh, again, every year, uh, beginning of the year, we have to bring a, a, a forward work program for the board. Um, th this year, we have a number of items on on the work program. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the items, the the actual timetable itself is flexible, the dependence on, on uh, actually the the work that we are doing during the year and the, the, the detail that we need to do. So, uh, however, all the subjects that we've identified on the work programme will be covered uh, this financial year. Right. Are there any questions? Yes, Shelley? Sorry, I'm putting my hand up. I'm a bit confused. <laughs> I was on Zoom yesterday. Um, yeah, oh. page 29. Sorry, I was getting confused as my um, what I could do. On, I um, just wanted to mention on um, page 29 of the um, uh, work plan, um, the capital and estates work stream. Um, we, we, I, I understood that the breast unit um, business case for YYF was also going to be coming to the the um, this year, and I think that was supposed to be in around June, July time. So I wondered if that was just needed to be put in. I appreciate it's a flexible a work plan, but I, I think that is something that's due to come to us. 
Um, I know Nicola perhaps can. Oh, she's Nicola? got her hand up. Yeah, that's why I put my hand up for it as well, Shelley. So thank you. Okay. I've, uh, you can cover that. So um, yeah, we planned originally to bring it to the May board. Um, we've had yeah. some issues where the the um, packages have come back, which has taken us above our outline business case cost. And um, from discussions with Welsh Government, this seems to be a common issue at the minute for business cases due to the market environment and, and some of the changes around the industry. So we've been working hard around the value engineering, value for money testing. So that's caused us a little bit of delay, but it is now scheduled to come to the July board. So we were, we were hoping we might be able to do something as a special board in June, but I think because of that work, July is probably when it will be scheduled. So I was going to come in, Shelley, just to say that was missing. We discussed it our executive team on Monday. So you are right to raise that. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, okay, Shelley? Yeah, I've got one other point on page 30, and it was just about the structured assessment, because obviously that would be going to January 2002 meeting, but in normal practice would be that it would go to the audit committee prior to that, and that's not shown on the um, the work plan, so I, I thought perhaps that ought to go in, so, um, you know, we, we're clear about what we're yeah. doing. Fine, thank you. We'll thank you. Uh, make that amendment. Uh, Tish? Thank you, Chair. Um, just one point. Um, Clearly, this, this is very helpful and sets yeah. out the work plan of the board, but all of the committees are um, putting together their work plans and it will be very helpful for all of those work plans to be consistent with each other. I know we've talked about this um, and those will then dovetail with with um, with the board work plan. So it's just for anyone who's listening who doesn't know that, that each of the committees have their own work plan and then that comes together Um to work in concert with this. Thank you for that clarification, Tij. Uh, they will be coming uh, and circulated imminently. Are there any other comments, concerns? Really, no? Just really helpful, I think. Thank you. Well, it will be subject to change. You never know. We have uh, a new ministerial team. And uh, so we will ad obviously advise the public uh, if we have to change this board work programme or there is anything uh, which is um, urgent coming from committees which need to be uh, uh, looked at uh, earlier by the board. Fine, thank you very much. The review of standing orders, Richard. Yes, Chair. Um, the review of standing orders, uh, we've had standing orders from uh, from the Welsh Government for uh, obviously a number of years. Um, th this year they, they've been revised, they were issued in, in April and they have to come to the board for adoption. Uh, within the paper I've identified the uh, major differences from the previous standing orders uh, to this year's and it it mainly recognises the, the use of virtual meetings such, such as this one. Um, the removal of the annual quality statements and uh, it's referencing the Senate uh, rather than, than uh, um, the Assembly because the, the previous ones mentioned the Assembly and there were some amendments to, uh, for, uh, to mention Audit Wales rather than Wales Audit Office so th those sorts of things were fairly minimal and uh, there were a number of, of changes and movements in the text around the scheme of delegation and th they have been listed uh, as well. Uh, I've also included the standing financial instructions and there's uh, a, a long list of the amendments uh, to those which uh, went to the audit committee uh, and the, the standing orders are here for uh, adoption today. Thank you. Uh, Shelley? You're on mute, Shelley. Sorry, one point of clarification on the on the cover report. Um, the documentation that went to the Audit, Finance and Risk Committee was this, the financial standing orders, not the whole suite of in, um, standing orders. I just thought we ought to make that clear. Thank you. Thank you. Judith? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to draw the board's attention to something that is contained in the cover paper, but probably worthy of noting is that um, the standing orders of WISC as a subcommittee of the board are also being updated and they will need to come back to the board um, at our next meeting. So just to note um, that those will need to be ratified by the board um, um, next time. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, are there any queries? Any other queries on this? No, I propose that accepted. Thank you. Is that agreed? 
Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to patient experience and public engagement and the report from uh, Anara and Bevan Nunes, the Health Board CHC. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm happy to present the CHC's report for the first time, I think, in the last 12 months. So apologies that we've not been able to present a paper to you until now. Um, as you can see from our report, we've not only adapted our ways of working to engage with people, but we've also continued a lot of our scrutiny function in terms of ambulance handovers and how we've dealt with those with the health board. Um, so in terms of um, our first project, which was a buddying scheme, is, it was conducted over FaceTime with iPads. Um, we just want to give um, enormous thanks to the person-centred care team um, for facilitating our action in being able to speak to patients directly in their hospital beds. So because of this, um, we were able to visit 25 wards. We were proposing to visit 35 wards, but we identified a Wi-Fi connection issue in some hospitals. So we're delighted to see that um, Wi-Fi is being installed on all of those wards. Um, as you can see, we spoke to a good uh, spread of people. We, we managed to speak to 96 people about their hospital stays during COVID. The majority of people were overwhelmingly grateful for the, the, the care and support offered by staff. Um, a thematic issue that we did bring up was that uh, some people felt a bit more isolated if they didn't have access to their own IT device to be able to call loved ones at home. Um, and in response, um, the health board has been uh, really positive in uh, demonstrating that you, you've invested in your own ICT um, support with increased iPads and increased um, access to um, facilities for people to be able to call their loved ones at home. Um, so because of the success of this project, we've been able to roll it out not only to um, mental health wards when Wi-Fi has been installed, but we've also conducted it in the community. So we've uh, got a project coming your way um, for Complex Care Huntington's team um, and also the Grange University Hospital. So we've got a number of projects coming off the back of that. And I just wish to thank you all for your, for your facilitation in, in helping us engage with those people. So our scrutiny and our executive committee. Oh, sorry, Chair, did you wish for me to take questions now or at the end? I can you see can carry on, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, the ambulance handover performance data that we review daily um, has come to the attention of our scrutiny and exec committee. Um, the, the, the waits for people at the front door over three hours has been a concern. So um, in order to raise this um, constructively with the health board, we've received two presentations now to our joint executive committee. And we've also had meetings with the health board's um, executive teams behind the scenes also. Um, I'd just like to thank um, the Director of Planning and the Director of Operations for meeting with us and WAST and having open conversations about the pressures within the urgent care system. I think I'd like to amend my comment in 2.3 about hospital flow pressures that are contributing to the waits and just add that we recognise that it isn't just hospital pressures, that there were also primary and community care um, access issues that are also impacting on the waits at the front door. So we've been really pleased to have these discussions with the Health Board and WAST about a whole breadth of work that's going on in order to improve weights at the front door, but also make sure that um, community and primary care services are equally accessible so that it stops people turning up at the Grange unnecessarily. Um, so we still remain concerned about this. I will update our executive committee tomorrow on the meeting that we held with the team yesterday. Um, but I'm really pleased to see that, you know, new work and new ways of working are being constantly thought of and taken through um, to test so that improvements can be seen. So I'd just like to thank you again for being open and honest with us in that respect. Um, you'll see that we also conducted a, a patient survey in County Hospital. Um, we returned to the County Hospital because pre-pandemic, we did hear a number of concerns from people in hospital a better perception of staffing, um, staffing support and staffing numbers. Um, these did come up again. Um, so even though we weren't able to undertake our face-to-face -face, uh, visits as we usually would with members attending the wards, 
um, people were still able to, to talk to us in a way as if we were there. So we were confident that we were still picking up things in a remote way um, and that the health board have been able to respond um, with a view that they will review um, the current staffing levels um, on uh, the newly appointed um, Oak Ward and Rowan Ward. So again, we just wish to thank um, the teams on those wards for um, handing out our survey. Um, we received these paper surveys back um, anonymously. So we just wish to thank the health board again for facilitating handing out our survey so that people could still have a voice there. Um, another project that we've been able to undertake in the community with a paper survey was a district nursing review. We've never been able to um, access people in their homes before, uh, but with the support of the, um, the leaders in the district nursing team, they again uh, distributed our, uh, our paper survey, gave access to an electronic version and also let people know how they could contact us directly if they couldn't complete the paper survey. Um, and we heard really positive feedback from over 158 people, which is a really good spread of, of service users in this, in this area. Um, so the, uh, the, the report um, will follow. So that's currently just been signed off. So the further details will be with you soon. I'll touch on the national reports that our board office, our board of community health councils have led on. And throughout COVID, we've undertaken a maternity experience report, uh, a feeling forgotten report, which focuses on people's weights for treatment um, and the increase in weights with RTTs. Um, and also um, we've done a, a, a patient experience review with orthodontic care. Um, and you can see that the themes that we've highlighted under each and the health board locally has been very good in responding to those national themes and how they would take those forward within those teams. Um, and I just wish to touch on our public um, feedback survey. So at the start of the pandemic, our Board of Community Health Councils launched a care during the coronavirus survey. It runs um, recurrently, there is no end date. And every month we review the previous month's feedback locally and we submit that to the Health Board in the form of a briefing. And that's taken forward through the executive team. And having um, attended a number of other um, internal Health Board meetings, such as primary care access, We've been really delighted to see that our feedback briefings are being taken to frontline staff to learn directly from these feedback briefings. So I can actually see a 360 view of how, our, how the public's data is being used and learned from. So to date, we have heard from nearly 500 people. We had heard initially of um, issues with B12 injections, which primary care were very proactive with addressing with all GPs in the area. We heard a number of positive experiences at the start, many people giving praise to the efforts of the NHS at the start of the pandemic. Um, we did have one or two individual troubling cases which were really um, isolated to those individuals um, in terms of you know, some people. Um, I, I think it all came down to a lack of being able to visit and access their loved ones whilst they were in hospital. So, um, now that communication has been improved and obviously visiting has been um, improved, we're hoping that um, people's anxieties for their loved ones in hospitals will start to reduce a little bit now. And finally, I just wish to pay um, thanks to the Health Board for the vaccination programme. Um, we've heard nothing but praise for how this area has handled the vaccination programme. Um, a consistent message is people turning up you know, five minutes for their appointment and that they're home before their appointment, you know, should have even taken place. So we just wish to thank the Health Board for an incredibly well orchestrated programme. Um, I know that you're ahead of schedule in the age brackets as well. Um, the initial issue of people being able to use the telephone number to call or change their appointment was addressed very, very quickly. Um, and, and like I said, we receive nothing but praise about this, about this programme of work now so I'm happy to take any questions please. Thank you very much Gemma and, and thank you and your CHC for the invaluable help and support that you provide to us in bringing back um, the views of patients and, and uh, carers it's really really helpful to the teams. 
Um, I will ask for questions and then Rhiannon will uh, respond. Uh, Pippa? Hi Gemma, um, welcome, <laughs> welcome today. Um, and um, I want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for all the work that you're doing because I recognise that it's just been incredibly hard for you to still maintain the kinds of contacts with patients that you've really needed to over the past year. And I, I just, I'm, I'm really amazed at how much you've managed to do because it makes such a difference to people, to the patients, to the families and to the care that we can give. So that was the first thing I wanted to say was thank you. Um, I had I have one small question, and I, I, I'm guessing that you probably won't have an answer to it today, but I'm thinking that maybe it's something that could be taken forward. And at the top of page 12, you've got a um, very small line that just says um, that you've heard a number of good experience with access to GPs, but a number of difficulties with people with remote access, uh, remote appointment access. And I know that um, uh, I've had a couple of conversations where people have said to me, they're not finding it as as easy as they would hope to get a, a remote appointment, um, and so I I don't as I said I don't suppose you've got an answer for this at the moment, but I wonder if it's something that um, the CHC could be uh, asking about more specifically in the future. Uh, I do have a, a, a really a clear answer for that. I'm really glad you've asked. We are running a virtual and, and remote appointment survey at the moment, concurrently with the GP access survey both of which we've just reported on. Um, again, I need to thank the Health Board for sharing this survey because at the point that the Health Board shared our survey, we've now heard from over 1,500 people um, who have either accessed a remote appointment or have accessed GP in some form. So both of those reports, because they were so significant in their size, have just been finished. Um, we've heard from people who have used the report remote appointments either as a video call or a telephone appointment with their GP have had equally good and bad experiences with that process and it's very it's very um, unique to the person because we've heard that some people would accept remote appointments for certain conditions but not others so it needs to come down to when you when you read the report it will be very condition specific um, in terms of people's acceptability of, of whether they'd like a face-to-face -face or a remote appointment. Um, but what we're hearing more so now is that there mustn't be... Sorry. What we're hearing more so now is that people do wa want to see um, a resumption of face-to-face -face appointments and that remotes shouldn't replace face-to-face. Um, -face. So... Um, very, very lengthy reports coming out exactly on that topic. That's um, brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, it'd be a really great learning ex learning point for us moving forward. So thank you so much. Definitely. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I was going to sort of um, follow up on that with Pippa because I think tr the transition now from sort of the, the COVID situation back to normal, if you've got normal inverted commas, is something which is important that access to primary services particularly is something we just need to look at. And if you do are doing that survey, maybe you could do something a bit later on as well. So we've got something, the current situation, which is still in transition compared to what may be a bit later on to see whether or not the public are. I mean, the, the important thing about the CHC is you're the voice of the patient. And I think what I've seen from this report is some really good stuff in terms of support, but also challenge and I think that's what is important um, and that the feedback that you provide um, is listened to and actioned and I think that's also equally important because after all if patients are saying these things we should listen to what they've got to say and action them mm. but I did want to just add one sort of final thing which is it's particular thanks for the input that's been provided first of all for the engagement with regard to the the Grange Hospital which I thought was because uh, I think you were on the, on the sort of the subcommittee that I was involved with and it was always very useful and informative advice on that but also with the vascular services uh, engagement uh, program which uh, I think has been incredibly helpful in bringing forward patient views and again that allows us as a board then to, to take on board the information and the advice and the sort of the, the, the um, well, looking at the data, looking at the sort of survey work, et cetera, and then for us to make decisions. So I think um, having uh, attended the joint board CHC meeting the other week, 
again, it was very useful to listen to what members of your board had to say and to know that um, and be, receive presentations as well. So I think all in all, is a good working relationship between the CHC uh, and the and Ira and Bevan uh, board. And just say, uh, long may this continue. And by the way, congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. Thank you. Phil? Yeah, uh, Snuggy Chair, very good report, Jim, as everybody has uh, alluded to. Um, what we tend to do, spend a lot of time doing, of course, is concentrating on what happens within the hospital walls. But it was really interesting um, and helpful, I think, in your presentation that you're starting to look and take more of a whole system view of what's happening in the hospital. Um, and I, I was interested to, to hear your comment about the, the some of the community deficits actually causing pressure on the front door of the Grange. Um, and I just wonder whether whether at some stage, whether we could get under the report a bit and look at some of the detail around some of that, which clearly you, you probably have, uh, because I think some of that detail would be very helpful for us to take into the regional partnership board environment to mm -hmm. look at our partners. So we get a, a, a proper whole system look at what those difficulties are from the from your perspective and the patient perspective. Um, so it would be useful at some stage if, if, if we could do that. I wouldn't expect that today, but, but if we could just touch base you know, sometime in the future. To look at what evidence you have underneath that, because that would be really helpful. Yeah. Thanks very much. I would endorse that, Phil. I think that's a very good idea. Um, are there any further questions before I? Oh, yes, Paul. Yeah, just to say about the. Um, I think that um, to make it clear that our social distancing restrictions, which I think um, is yeah. important, that we also take on board. And until those restrictions are removed, then obviously we need we need to make sure. With, with yourself, um, Gemma, that um, everybody is briefed and aware of that as well. Yes. So, uh, I think just to sort of put that in place in context, I'm grateful for Judith for the, the sort of the, the update on that. Yeah. No, it is really important. We're not out of this yet. Yeah. We're not back to normal. Thank you, Paul. Um, Rhiannon, would you like to respond, please? Yeah, th thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you, Gemma. I, I think that um, it would be important just to state that we've got really positive communication and regular communication with the Community Health Council. Um, and one of the things that Gemma touched on there was the responsiveness of the health board, which I actually think is an important metric in terms of demonstrating that um, person-centred care and, and patient experience is important to us and, and that feedback is vital. I think the element of the CHC being independent is important and, and therefore gives really rich information for us to secure improvements and learning. There were two areas I probably wanted to specifically um, pick up on, and that was the FaceTime buddying project. A couple of members have already mentioned it, but we, we did receive the report at executive team and uh, last month's Quality and Safety Committee, um, the, the, the name of which has changed now, but um, at that committee. Uh, I mean, I think everybody recognised how valuable it was um, and the fact that Phil has just picked up on there that we're spreading this. So we did a test of change in hospitals. It's easier to manage that, um, but then we've had really good uh, response in terms of widening to district nursing. And as Gemma said, an area that we haven't um, what we haven't undertaken previously. The other issue was communication, um, and it's been incredibly challenging through the COVID period where we've restricted visiting, and um, that's had a tremendous impact on patients and families in terms of family stresses um, about not being able to contact, and, and the almost daily um, re it, it feedback that Judith and I were getting, particularly during the our surges, um, where people just could not get through on the telephone, and we, we understood the reasons for that. Um, and just to provide some assurance to to, um, board members but but also any uh, public that we've taken real action in terms of addressing wi-fi with a plan um uh, addressing the uh, availability of more mobile phones the wi-fi and there's been such great collaboration between the chc our um, informatics team and the person-centered care team i think it just puts in um really good models for how we um move forward and I'd wish to see that that continuing, of course. In terms of the FaceTime project, we're the only organisation in Wales that's done anything like it. And I think we can't underestimate the, the impact and that valuable feedback. 
And just to pick up on some of the comments that have been made, just in terms of the urgent care transformation and the work that we need to do, we, we know um, the concern of the CHC, we, we echo that concern, and that's why we've got um, this as a particular targeted piece of work. But patient experience and engagement of the public in that urgent care transformation is critical, and just for assurance that that is happening. Um, it, this isn't about us just doing this, it's about understanding the experience and taking a very wholesome system approach to to that improvement. And if I may, Chair, I just wanted to touch on visiting. I think it is very important, and not least because of the impact it's had. But again, for assurance, and just I know I've been communicating with the CHC, but now we're at alert level two across Wales, which is um, a, a relief. Um, or, albeit some, some concerns um, are ongoing in terms of variants of concern, um, but that we have now relaxed the visiting restrictions. We've had a really successful pilot in Neville Hall, um, which happened last week because we've introduced testing for visitors just for um, a cautious approach and for safety of both patients, the public and staff. That's now spreading this week to the Grange University Hospital and as Butty and Iron Bevan and pending the evaluation early next week we'll be looking to spread that across all of our sites um, within the next two weeks. Um, we've had very positive feedback thus far in terms of the approach so um, I, I'd hope that the challenges we've had with communication will ease albeit the volume of complaints that we receive in months ago ha have significantly eased and communication has improved greatly um, it, it certainly in the last two months. So thank you Chair. Thank you very much, Rhiannon. Um, are there any further questions to Gemma or a response to Rhiannon? If not, thank you so much, Gemma, for, for an extremely helpful report and um, for some really good and important data coming to us and the cooperation we received from the CHC to help us to deliver really high quality care. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. If we can move on to the presentation on the core care team model, I'd like to uh, welcome Linda Alexander, the Assistant Director of Nursing, who will introduce the team she has with her. Morning. Morning. <laughs> morning, Chair. Borada, good morning. Um, and thank you for inviting us along this morning uh, to share our story around the core care team. Just by way of introduction, uh, I'm sure many board members will recall back in 2019, the health board was in really quite a worrying situation whereby we had a significant RN vacancy factor of over 350 whole time equivalent RN vacancies. At this point, our new Executive Director of Nursing, Rhiannon Jones, actually joined the organisation and recognised immediately that we had to act quickly but safely to introduce new ways of working. Not only to meet our statutory requirements of the Nurse Staff and Levels Wales Act 2016, but most importantly, to enable us to provide the best possible care uh, to our patients. So um, we did work at pace. Uh, we did work in a safe way to introduce new models of care and what is now, what is now known as the core care team model. And this really is a very new, it was a very new and an innovative approach foc focusing on safe and effective delegation. The, the new model actually opened up a significant amount of new opportunities for our existing staff as well, Intr introducing new roles such as roster creators, ward assistants, patient care assistants and assistant practitioner roles. The focus of today's story is that of the assistant practitioner nursing role. And I have to say the success of this role has been a consequence of excellent nurse leadership. Maria, who will follow on from me, is an example of a nurse leader who's fully embraced this new role, supporting best progress and development, which has brought about significant benefits to the care we can now provide uh, within our wards. I will now I'll hand over to Marie and Beth, who will tell their story, and you'll see that they've got a presentation that they would wish to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Borida, good morning. My name is Maria Gould. I am the ward sister on C0 here at the Grange University Hospital. 
Um, we've been working at the Grange now for six months and we created a new team merging staff from Neville Hall and the World Went. And we also change specialities when we come over as well to ENT, maxillofacial, and we also do general surgery. Our ward is a highly pressured area with high acuity emergency patients taking up 23 of our beds with a high daily turnover. And we then have eight elective green pathway beds, which primarily admit USC head and neck patients, general surgery, vascular and gynaecology at the moment. And we do lists alternate weeks as well for thyroid surgery. So needless to say, our ward is very patient focused and keeps us very busy. Um, just to give you some background into our approach to the assistant practitioner role, I knew Beth as a healthcare support worker at Neville Hall. She worked on a neighbouring ward and I was overjoyed to hear that she'd be transfer transferring to my ward as an assistant practitioner as her work ethic is second to none. Um, Beth couldn't have joined our team at a more crucial time. We were going through a period where we had significant vacancies and challenges in recruitment and her role formed a major part of the core care model that was introduced to focus on prudent principles of health care. So basically, in a nutshell, our assistant practitioner role bridges bridge the, bridge the gap that then allows myself and my registered nurses to safely delegate practice, freeing us up to focus on what we need to do to deliver high levels of effective care to our patients. <laughs> Sorry, the slides was American. <laughs> Um, so I've done a lot of work as a ward sister on delegation with our healthcare support workers, some of which was recognised as exemplary by HEIW. I really embrace the outcomes from this project and I think that that set the foundation for the delegation process with our assistant practitioners. We found that appropriate and effective delegation has been key to the successful implementation of this new role and empowering all staff within this process has been an element I particularly focused on from the beginning. Benefits of safe delegation were apparent from very early on. So at Neville Hall, we developed a culture that took this forward. And this is something that I'm embedding now in my new team here at the Grange. I truly believe that the support of the assistant practitioner role has been invaluable in our transition to the Grange. The skills have been transferable to the new site. In fact, they've had more opportunities to enhance them and develop them over here as well, especially with our AOA patients. And by achieving these more specialist competencies, will allow them to practice at the top of their licence through the benefit in the care our patients will receive. Beth has also played a significant role in supporting our qualified nurses and most recently our overseas nurses and she's proven to be an imperative part of the team. I now hand you over to Beth to explain what a day in the life of an assistant practitioner is like first hand. Good morning. Can I please start with introducing myself? My name is Beth Spence and I'm currently an assistant practitioner at Ward CEO at the Grange University Hospital. I first joined the health board back in 2008 as an healthcare support worker on a TNO board at Neville Hall. While I was there, I developed my studies and went on and completed a community health and wellbeing foundation degree. During this time, the health board supported me to achieve this degree. By achieving this qualification, it enabled me to apply for the band four system practitioner role. I am very grateful for the opportunity from the health board as it provides recognition for further development and skills for the healthcare support worker. I'm also very grateful for the support of my ward manager, Maria Gould. An healthcare support worker's day and an assistant practitioner's day is very different. When I was an healthcare support worker's day, my day would start out with handover of the patients I was caring for, I would assist the patients with all fundamentals of care alongside taking their blood sugar reading and carrying out their observations. As for my assistant practitioner day, this starts off the same with handover, then going to the ENT treatment room and making sure the room is ready and stocked for procedures. Throughout my day then, I have various jobs that I now have the skills for. Being an assistant practitioner now allows me to check on patients that are scoring on the news. The news is a scoring system that helps indicate potential deterioration. I then monitor these patients and liaise with outreach. I will admit patients and get them ready for surgery and will look after these patients post-op. I now have gained the skills to put in cannulas and can take bloods. I can now catheterise patients and address complex wounds. I am able to weigh patients and can make referrals to many different services such as dietitians, district nurses, diabetic nurse, physios and OT. And as my ward at the Grange is an ENT specialist ward, I can now also perform tracheostomy care. I can now offer a lot more information to the patients about the care they are receiving and the aftercare they will receive after being discharged. 
Just by me talking about how different these two roles are, you can see how much of a positive care environment and how much achievement the assistant practitioner role has within the team. I love being an assistant practitioner as I can now give patients more information about their care and have developed more skills to implement that care. I love being able to address their needs straight away rather than putting extra work on the registered nurse. It's lovely for me to say, yes, I can do that straight away for you, rather than me saying, let me go and get someone who can do that for you. I remembered I nursed one lady at Neville Hall while I was an healthcare support worker, who have since been admitted to the, un to the Grange University Hospital, where I'm currently an assistant practitioner. She remembers me every time and was absolutely delighted to learn of my progression as an assistant practitioner. She always likes me caring for her and is always grateful of the care she receives from me. We always say good morning when I arrive at work and we always say good night when I leave to each other. It's the little things like this that makes the biggest difference. Again, I would like to thank the Health Board for this opportunity and thank you to you all for listening to my story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, uh, I will bring uh, I will bring the board in for uh, questions, but I'm really, really grateful to you all for bringing your experience to the board. As Rhiannon knows, I'm a massive fan of of the assistant practitioner grades. Uh, I think they do an invaluable job as part of uh, of the team. So thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, to uh, Linda and Beth and Linda <laughs> and Maria? No? Yeah, Tish? And then Emrys. Thank you, Chair. Um, just firstly to say many congratulations, Beth, for um, your um, progression and development. I think it's fantastic and that's certainly something that um, we at the Health Board really want to see that people are able to, to progress and develop their careers in a way that, that suits them best. So congratulations and, and well done both to you and to the team for supporting you through it. I'm just, um, I'm just wondering on a, on a wider question. We do want progression. That is absolutely spot on. I'm just wondering if that then provides a vacuum um, where our health care support workers are moving through and how we how we might fill that vacuum. Are we proactively going out and bringing in new people to develop into the um, into that that role? Um, would, would you, Chair, would you like me to answer? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we have, a, we definitely do have a plan. We're bringing in, as people progress onto the band four role, we are bringing further healthcare support workers into the health board. And we've actually progressing them now to, to band three and into band four role. So, so making sure that there is progression. We're very mindful that our health care workers are the back of our nursing workforce uh, and it's really important that we embrace this and ensure that we have um, a career progression for these individuals as well. So we're constantly, as people move on, we're bringing new people into the health board and offering them the same, uh, the same opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Emrys? Just want to say what a, an excellent presentation to the board today and uh, well done to Beth in what she's achieved. Um, there's just two questions I have in this. One is that would we expect this to be a, uh, a type of method that's got a uh, working methods that are going to be introduced across all divisions? That's the first part. And the second one then is obviously we've had uh, raised within um, our board meetings. Uh, I've discussed many times about the nursing vacancies. Um, with this new type of role, do we foresee a different type of workforce plan going forward? Linda? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the band four role is already um, in within other divisions, um, and it's not to the probably the extent that we have uh, it in acute, but it's something that we are definitely looking to roll out to other divisions. Uh, and just for the board to be aware is that we are leading this on, on an all Wales basis as well. 
Um, so under um, Rihanna's uh, leadership, we've now taken over um, chairing and leading the band for work right across across Wales. Um, so it's most definitely a, a model that we'd be looking to roll out um, right across um, the health board, but right across Wales as well. Um, and we'll, many health boards in Wales are looking to us as to how we've done it. Um, so I think, you know, it's good kudos for the, the health board as well. Yeah, and Judith makes a good point in in our ability then to create band three work opportunities for people living in our communities, which is really important. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chris, oh, sorry, do you want to come back, Emrys? I, I just wanted to check, was there, sorry, on the second, thank you for that, uh, Linda, and thank you for uh, your response, and, and it's good to see what we're doing on a national basis as well as local. But it was just the second part of my question, Chair, around um, will it have an effect on the future workforce plan? It's, it is um, it is most definitely being considered in our future workforce plan, and um, as we, you know, we don't want to lose this. We, we've recognised that there is an absolutely play, a place for this role. Um, with the Nurse Staff, Staff and Levels Wales Act, we do a biannual recalculation every um, every year as well. Uh, and heads of nursing are being asked to consider the band three, band four role in all the nurse work, nursing workforce models going forward, uh, because we've recognised what a pivotal role this plays. So it most definitely is part of our, um, our nursing model going forward. Um, and, and just a response to that, Chair, is just say that it's really positive to see that the focus is on skills, not just about professions. Yes. Thank, thanks, Emrys. Rhiannon? Thank you, Chair. And it was to follow on with Linda has said and a point that Emrys has just picked up because I think it is wider now than nursing. Um, although our assistant practitioners for nursing are, are vital, as Beth has demonstrated and adequately or more than adequately articulated the difference between the healthcare support workers that were and this assistant practitioner role. What we have done um, and is certainly part of our workforce planning is the co core care team itself um, has created not just the assistant practitioner role, which has been huge successful but in addition new roles so we've taken like a prudent prudent registered nurse approach so registered nurses only doing what registered nurses should do and others taking on so the roster creators for example which used to take an inordinate amount of time of the ward sister um, so that being allocated to other individuals who have got skills so that we release the sister's time to do what she needs to do the ward assistants which Linda touched on and the, the key role in ensuring effective communication with relevant so it is all part of our workforce planning and creating a very different model for care going forward, not just in hospitals, but, but across the piece. Thank you. Thank you, Rhiannon. Uh, Chris and then Paul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, like everyone else, I was impressed by the, the presentation and particularly Beth's enthusiasm for a new role. Uh, I think Rhiannon's probably answered the, the first part of my question, which was about the opportunities outside hospital. And I was thinking particularly in district nursing in the community. Um, and I wondered how far we'd got with that. My second point, I think, is probably similar to Emeris, uh, his point about the wider workforce and the learning for other healthcare professionals and whether the board could have uh, a presentation on the opportunities and what we've achieved there. Rhiannon? Yeah, th thanks very much, Chris. Um, just the just for assurance, the discussions between myself and Peter, particularly in terms of the wider um, spread of this role, and actually in terms of assistant practitioners, how we think about Beth was talking there about how she can refer to other professions. But uh, I'd I'd absolutely see this going even further now that there'll be core skills and competencies that Beth could pick up, and um, which will ease so that we have prudent dietitians, prudent prudent physio, prudent OT. So um, we're definitely having those conversations. They're still early. Um, I probably just flag that th this has been a huge amount of work and a huge cultural shift. Um, I, I wouldn't want us to underestimate that, not that anybody is, but um, COVID has interrupted play a little bit because we had a robust evaluation on this. But of course, that our world was turned upside down, but we've still got some um, huge positives that have, that have come out from this. Um, and, and just to say, it would be um, really important the spread of this across all divisions, um, not just where Linda has identified there nationally as well. Um, 
complex care at home, for example, um, where we've got really high acuity individuals being cared for in their own homes on ventilators. And we've got band fours who work in that environment. And we learned a lot of lessons. So they were ahead of what, what we've done here with this model. We learned a lot of lessons. But what is important is robust governance, um, the delegation framework, which Maria mentioned, and the importance of how we're very clear about the competencies, um, because patient safety and and quality is at the centre of this, as well as ensuring that we're addressing what was a, a significant risk for us from a workforce perspective 18 months ago. We're in a far better position now as a result of, well, stuff that I'll talk about when I, I, I go through the Staffing Act paper. Thank you. Thanks, Rhiannon. Paul? I mean, I think this is some excellent practice there. And I just want to say to you, Anna, you know, very well done on the, the initiatives, et cetera. And also, I thought it was an excellent presentation from the, the members of the team there. The one area I'd like us to perhaps, um, I, I support what Chris said about a presentation, because I think it is about different models going forward. And in particular, to look at the role of the apprenticeship system. Because I think with the um, the nurses, the apprenticeships, I think it's a, a very mixed economy that could be available to help and support people in the community. So I think um, this ap appears to sound like really good practice or excellent practice that could be developed. And if we are doing some groundbreaking work across the, the board, et cetera, let's explore this further. I think currently with young people um, who are leaving school and are looking for opportunities for work, etc. I think it's a really good opportunity for us to uh, showcase what is available in the um, National Health Service locally uh, for young people to come and join us um, in, and what may be available, what routes are available. I mean, I was incredibly impressed with the, the foundation degree element as well that was mentioned. I mean, that's you know, a wonderful opportunity for uh, people to progress rather than staying in particular roles if they want to progress. So I think let's open the conversation up perhaps a bit more and have a presentation and, uh, and then look to see what can be done uh, to, to link in with the careers services um, and employment and schools, perhaps, with regard to the opportunities that are available you know, for young people working for the Anaira and Bevan Board, because after all, it's a, it's a huge employer locally. Thank you, Paul. Geraint, do you want to respond to that? And then I'll bring Rhiannon in. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, absolutely agree, Paul. I think, you know, this is a real opportunity for us now to um, take a look at our, our approach to apprenticeships. I think it needs a refresh. Um, we're just about actually to bring a paper to executive team looking at, you know, what what are the opportunities for us in this space? So things like Kickstart, for instance, we're currently making an application now for 30, uh, 30 places. And of course, that's for 16 to 24 year olds. So that sort of approach is really going to be important as a way forward. So we'll have something to bring to the board on that, I think, which which, which should be quite interesting. I just wanted to make another quick point, if I might, Chair. I think yes. the other the other benefit of what you've heard around the uh, the new approach um, is that um, is it, is actually part of the process. So in looking at the delegation framework and involving the nurses and the healthcare support workers in that, what we saw was that there were also other benefits. So we saw a reduction in, in um, sickness levels and an improvement in PADR rates. So it's not just about it, you know, this sort of inclusive approach. It's not just about the skills uh, issues, which is really important, but also it brings v other very important benefits. Thank you. Thanks, Geraint. Uh, Rhiannon? Yeah, uh, thank, thanks, Chair. And I was going to follow what um, uh, Geraint had said there in terms of uh, we're, we're definitely on the page in terms of apprenticeships. I think that's a really important point, Paul. Um, I, I think I'd probably just want to flag as well is that we, we've got a really strong healthcare support worker development framework in Wales. I, I think the, the key message and the reflection, certainly from my perspective, and I know we've had discussions about this previously, is that we have a maximised that framework. Um, Beth talked about operating at top of life as well as Maria and I think it is just so important but the other end of that whole bring people in our apprenticeship model band two band three band four what what next and I think what this has done is really enabled us to identify um, key individuals people with talent that we can support through to registered nurse training or other professional training um, really enables us to identify people and say right you, we are going to support you now through to your registered nurse training it's just so exciting um, and 
I think that we just grow and grow. There, there's going to be far more opportunities as a result of this model. And I, I am hugely excited and very proud, uh, proud of the, the leadership. Um, Linda, I have to bring um, in. She, she has just been tremendous in leading this work. But ward sisters are critical when we've evaluated where you've had a really engaged, um, can see the vision um, uh, like a sister like Maria, without doubt, the assistant practitioners have, have shone um, in areas where we haven't quite had that buy in. The assistant practitioners haven't had such a great experience, so it is really rounded in the approach, but um, it, it has been positive. Lin Linda has just been the stalwart of it and has really made it happen together with individuals like Beth and Maria. Without, without them, we wouldn't be where we are. So um, I, I just feel very proud. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your leadership of this, but particularly to Rhiannon, who really pushed this. Yeah. Uh, in in not terribly easy circumstances uh, and it's going to make such a difference to our our communities and our patients and thank you very much indeed and we look forward to coming in visiting the ENT ward uh, to see how you're getting on in, in a couple of months so thank, you, thank you very much indeed thank you thank you um, can we move on to items for decision and the uh, compliance with the Nurse Staffing Act? Rhiannon. Thank you, Chair. And, and, and absolutely the flow through from that presentation, um, it was important for that story to, to bring actually the Nurse Staffing Levels Act to life. Um, I am conscious we've got a, a statutory responsibility to report on the Staffing Act and it is critically important for quality and safety of care as well as the staff experience. The story undoubtedly brings what I'm going to say to life without a shadow of a doubt. Um, this is a legislative um, report and it's one where the presentation style is prescribed uh, centrally. Uh, th this annual report covers the period of the 6th of June um, 2020 to the 5th of June 2021. Um, I won't go through the responsibilities further. The board are very familiar with the requirements of the Act and um, this paper uh, is about the annual review of nurse staffing, um, but with regard to the duty placed on the board, particularly in relation to Section 25A, which is essentially about having sufficient nurses to allow time to care for patients sensitively wherever they are receiving care. In terms of the report, it does highlight um, the outcomes of the reviews on Section 25B wards, which are currently medical and surgical wards, but that our duty applies to nursing care wherever it is provided and commissioned. So it was just to, to highlight that point. I couldn't really present this report without referencing the extremely challenging year that we've had. Um, I, I know the board are well aware of that, but the difficulties of complying with the Act um, and evidence in compliance with the Act, I, I think the, well, I, I hope that the paper demonstrates that. Uh, certainly the appendices that are included and, and the one particularly in Appendix 2, which um, tries to illustrate or does illustrate the amount of repurposing of wards that happened during the pandemic and our challenge um, hour by hour to ensure that we re were recording that um, where we did have some difficulties with without a doubt. Um, I, I think it would be fair to highlight that um, the Act would have presented challenges to the whole of NHS Wales in terms of demonstrating compliance but importantly with, with the expectations we have complied with so to, to give that assurance to the board um, but during the past year we've had three letters from the Chief Nursing Officer for Wales, which have highlighted what the expectations are, but also the dispensations in terms of the act in light of the COVID pandemic. So we are required to undertake a biannual review of staffing levels um, on all of our Section 25B wards, medical and surgical wards, and the board will record from the paper last board meeting that this will be spread into paediatric inpatient wards from um, the autumn. There's a significant amount of work that's been undertaken, um, some of which you've just heard about in that um, staff story, but from April 20, where we were entering our surge of COVID, a huge amount of work to reset the establishments and be very realistic about what staffing levels um, would be available on each of those wards. And I know there was some chairs action in terms of that piece of work, uh, but that was set on the demand, the capacity, the COVID environment we were operating with 
with, but particularly the huge gaps that we had in staff absence uh, due to either COVID itself, sickness or shielding. Um, I've highlighted the appendix two shows the repurposing of wards. Uh, we also had new COVID pathways introduced um, and our systems that we rely on to ensure our compliance with the Act really struggled. So where we set up new wards, um, we then didn't have the uh, health roster system set up to enable us to capture the establishments. And additionally, we use a health and care monitoring system to capture metrics um, and we didn't have those systems set up on the new report purposed wards. So I'm just sharing that because our report needs to tell a story here about how difficult this has been, but how we've achieved what we've achieved. Um, so at scale, I, I, I've mentioned. We opened the Grange early, as people know, that did present a significant opportunity to relook at nursing establishments um, in preparation for that early opening. And it was a huge amount of work in terms of um, confirming what those establishments would look like. It isn't just about staffing numbers, so how many healthcare support workers and how many registered nurses. We clearly need to take into account skills, competencies, experience of those individuals. Um, and with the reset establishments, we, we clearly introduce new roles with PACE, the ward assistant roles, the patient care assistants, and, and any hands on deck really when we went through our surges, which was really important to ensure safe patient care. We undertook a further calculation in January this year. We didn't have to, um, but, but we took a pragmatic approach. And I had some discussions with um, the corporate nursing team and heads of nursing, divisional nurses. But could we cope with doing that, uh, particularly during January? Um, but the message was loud and clear that we felt it was the right thing to do. So it wasn't mandated, but, but we did it. I presented a paper um, to execs. Uh, Monday, uh, which just outlined the findings of that review um, and, and recognising that we are maintaining status quo with the current establishments um, because we recognise the challenge. And as we come out of our second surge, we will be undertaking a further audit in June to understand the implications. We'll have had a, a longer period of time to assess, particularly for the Grange, but also the ELGHs, where we need to remember, of course, that Neville Hall and the Royal Gwent look very different now to how they looked when we first set the establishment so that's going to be an important um, piece of work. We've taken the triangulated approach. This is um, multidisciplinary, so um, it is not only a nursing business. Uh, we, we have huge support from finance colleagues and, and I must mention workforce and OD colleagues. Um, so that triangulated approach looks at patient acuity and the board will know through the Quality and Patient Safety Committee, but also through executive team, that, that we have been concerned about the high acuity and high dependency of our inpatients currently, um, which is having an impact on um, staffing levels. We look at the acuity. We also take into consideration a number of quality and safety metrics. They are prescribed. That is um, inpatient falls. That is complaints that have um, a particular focus on whether nursing and nurse staffing levels had an impact. Uh, pressure ulcers, and, and again, we've had uh, numerous discussions at the Quality and Patient Safety Committee in terms of pressure ulcers. And the, the final metric is medication errors where uh, nurse staffing has been cited as, a, as, as an indicator. So with all of that information, it provides a rich set for us to review. Do we think our staffing levels are right? Is the experience right? And I'd probably just flag that whilst we were um, at a very high risk because of the significant number of vacancies some 18 months ago, our position is so much better with nearly a 50% improvement in registered nurse vacancies currently. Um, that's brought now a new risk, which is overseas nurses who will take time to embed. Um, a, a, and it is a different culture. And additionally, um, newly registered nurses within our workforce, um, which is through the national streamlining approach, the new, new nurses, um, whether they're new to our country or new um, as in newly qualified, uh, means that they, they haven't got the, the competencies and the skills that are required. And we do need to take that into consideration. As a result of the acuity audit, uh, myself and Linda met with the um, individual teams within divisions, so essentially the, the heads of nursing and divisional nurses, 
it, it was a support and challenge session because I was presented with a report which indicated we, we needed quite a few million pounds worth of more nurses. Um, and from my perspective, our core care team model and the approach that we've outlined through the story is not about more registered nurses. It's about looking at workforce very, very differently. Um, and I think that's the that's the only way that we're going to manage this. So the acuity audit that we'll be undertaking now in June will be quite key. So the other element which is important is that in terms of the Act, we have a clear escalation process in place. So where I mentioned there, some of the IT challenges with the wards that we'd set up and the additional capacity, always front and centre is professional judgment, and that is really important. So in terms of the, the ward sisters who are key, but the senior nurses, they will give a professional view as to whether the staffing levels uh, in terms of competency, skill and experience are right. And that's been front and centre of all decision making and um, really important. Our staffing is reported to the safety huddle with executives every week and we report that back to the executive team. I'm confident in saying that whilst there have been issues associated with the numbers of staff that we've had in our wards during COVID, and that, that's been global, not, not just a health board issue, um, we, we haven't extrapolated uh, a concern in relation to serious incidents or complaints where the nurse staffing level has been an issue. So we have been able to adapt uh, based on the environment. So no incidents have been attributable to not maintaining the planned roster. And I think that's important and just demonstrates the amount of work that our teams do on a day to day, sometimes hour by hour basis to ensure that staffing um, is appropriate and that patient care um, and, and safety is at the heart of what we do. So to conclude, um, I think I can safely say we have clear processes in place. Uh, as demonstrated, we've got innovative approach to strengthen the contribution of nursing, but other workforce um, colleagues as well. Um, we've adopted this prudent approach, um, which is only doing what registered nurses should do. And I'm pleased to say, uh, I, I've mentioned the, the significant reduction in registered nurses, but the effort that has gone into, even during the pandemic, to reduce those vacancies um, has, has been truly phenomenal. Um, and I can't thank our teams enough for the work they've done. Uh, we've recruited 129 healthcare support workers since September, which is just incredible, um, not, not least when you consider the environment. So the functionality of Click has been really helpful for us to extrapolate quality and safety data. Um, and we will be moving forward in terms of next steps to a national system to enable us to review um, whether we're maintaining the rosters that, that we believe we should be maintaining. Uh, this is quite an arduous function for each health board at the moment to extrapolate that data and analyse it. And there's got to be an easier way. And, and there is a national piece of work that, that's exploring that. So I can assure the board that we've taken all reasonable steps to ensure that time is allocated to ensure safe um, and appropriate care for patients and that that care delivery is done with sensitivity, uh, recognising the unprecedented challenge that we've had over the past year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rhiannon. And I think we'd endorse the fact that this is a really helpful report compiled under very, very hard circumstances indeed. Uh, to try and maintain uh, the safety of the patient's care. Uh, are there any questions to Rhiannon? Well done. No. Pippa? Yes, just, just one really. I mean, first of all, I, I want to say well done, congratulations. I mean, it's just a, a huge amount of, of work and effort has gone in. Um, it's more of a comment than a question, really. You, because I, you did note it, um, so I know that it's in your mind. But when we're talking about uh, new nurses, whether they're new uh, overseas or, or just recently qualified, and how do we make sure that we don't have any problems, complaints, never events with those nurses? So what's the kind of wraparound care and support that we can give them in order to make sure that they're doing the best job that they can? Yeah, thank you, Pippa. It is really important and one that we've been flagging um, as a new risk um, uh, across executive team. Um, we've invested it essentially. So we've got um, quite a bit of pastoral support, particularly for our overseas nurses. Um, and we have boosted 
boosted the um, the uh, practice educator facilitators who support both the um, assistant practitioners uh, and newly registered nurses and our overseas nurses. So we've ensured quite a bit of investment to um, to manage this issue and ensure appropriate support. Be important to flag that in terms of newly registered nurses, there are clear expectations in terms of the experience for newly registered nurses. Um, I, I think that we we play an important role as a as a corporate nursing team to ensure that that happens. There's a new approach with the NMC in terms of um, post-registration standards um, and we're just going through a process now of changing the approach from preceptorship and mentorship to um, assessment and support. We're well on track to ensure that we're compliant with that approach and that our students get a very good experience um, and, and then therefore want to come back to us when they qualify. So we're, we're fully cognizant that we, we can't just employ people and not ensure that they've got the support they need. Um, I probably just flag importantly that uh, we've we've just been considerate, considerating considering considering this issue of overseas nurses, particularly because we've had such a huge cohort from India. Um, and with everything that's going on in India, our pastoral approach to supporting these staff, um, there's lots of work going on to understand how we can support, what more we need to do, and some investment to support that. I, I hope that answers you. you. Yes, and that's great. And, and actually, I'm really pleased as well to hear about the additional support that's going in for, for those nurses who've come from India who uh, probably got families and are very worried at the moment. So thanks. Thanks, Rhiannon. Emrys? Again, Rhiannon, thanks for an excellent uh, report of what's going on with, with our staffing levels and certainly recognising what we've what you've had to manage over the past year. And it's and that's been quite outstanding, uh, to, to be fair. I've got two questions and one comment. So the first question is, is that um, when you're looking at the um, the what influences uh, some of the issues on staffing levels within clinical areas, and we've talked about acuity dependency, you know, um, falls, medication errors, etc. Is there any Anything at all that's um, or any differences between modern buildings and older buildings that might have an effect in respect of care? That's my first question. Uh, acknowledging that some of these might be older, longer, bigger buildings and stuff compared to a newer one. The second one then is, is that we've just listened to our previous agenda item of a, an excellent presentation about the core care team model and you know and the, how much it's praised about what it's doing and how it's delivering in a skills perspective do we ever foresee that uh, and perhaps it's an unfair question but i'll ask it anyway but uh, do we ever see that the um an assessment of skills and what's needed to deliver care might differ to what's required from what we've been stated from the nurse staffing um act and my final point was is that i notice on the um uh, community nursing um uh, information. It said that it requires us a 26.9% uplift and I was, and it's not a question, but it's just checking where we're going in relation to that, recognising that we are developing a community focused model of care. Thank you. I'm pleased to say that I'm able to answer all of those, I think, but I'll, I'll leave you to be the judge of it. Uh, thank you, Emrys. In terms of buildings, a really interesting one, I, I think without a doubt, um, new modern buildings have a positive impact on the staff experience. What we haven't um, identified through our metrics review and certainly the root cause analysis that goes on through any incidents that happen is that the building has contributed. Now, this will be really interesting. We, we've, we've had um, the single room environment, for example, um, in both YYF and uh, uh, as Betty and Iron Bevan in Ebervale, we, we haven't found that that's had an impact particularly um, in terms of incidents for patients, but it's definitely had an impact in terms of the staffing establishment and what's required. That certainly come through. We learned the lessons in terms of um, YYF and YAB for the opening of the Grange, but our um, 
January acuity audit, uh, the sisters, senior nurses and heads of nursing are clearly identifying that irrespective of the establishments we set uh, that were agreed, uh, professionally agreed and set, they're really struggling with the size of the environment and the visibility of patients. So that that is going to be something that's going to come out of the, the June audit for sure. So I think buildings do have um, a really important fact. It is really important. It's more um, experiential than any impact on metrics metrics per se. In terms of the um, Staffing Act and uh, registered nurses, I, I will. Um, I, I think that we need to be much more creative. The Staffing Act doesn't identify it's about registered nursing and numbers, but it is about the fact that without doubt there's clear evidence that registered nurses um, and more of them has a, a very positive impact on patient outcomes. Um, so I am always going to be um, a, an ambassador for that. And, would expect that. Our approach has been one that we want the registered nurse to do what only they can do. And I know I've mentioned it a couple of times, but we have so many, it, often um, nurses take on stuff and others can do it. We talked about the roster earlier. I cannot tell you how much time a ward sister takes developing that roster. Um, and yet we've got these roster creators now. It's taken so much time off the ward sister. That's not a saving um, as in finance, but it is a quality saving because she can inject, inject that time now into to effective leadership um, of her ward. So I think that the RN role is very clear, the evidence is clear in terms of impact for patient outcomes um, and the role of leadership, absolutely critical. What I think though, is we do need to be more creative in our workforce planning and what a ward establishment looks like, what a community establishment looks like. Um, and in some ways, I, I'm just very mindful that the Staffing Act doesn't um, stifle that creativity. Um, and, we, and, and I will be absolutely um, flying the flag for multidisciplinary team approach, multi-agency team approach, and that everyone's got a role to play. Um, but registered nurses are vital. And then in terms of the community and the uplift, um, we're actually doing very well against the district nursing principles um, as part of a further extension to the act should, should that come in due course. Um, and the 29 point, the 26.9% uplift we are pretty compliant with. It's not as easy to um, identify the uplift. It's easier within a hospital setting because you've got a set number of patients um, on the whole um, and fluctuations in acuity, but essentially we can pretty much determine what staff you need within the community is much more nuanced because the caseload as you'll be aware can expand and contract um, but without a doubt uh, that that requirement is is needed and we are seeing much more higher acuity patients within the community as well um, our whole care closer to home model we're seeing people that we we wouldn't we would have ordinarily seen in hospital being cared for in the community so some of the work we're doing around frailty assessment so that we can really understand patient acuity. Our team um, have been instrumental, our district nursing teams have been instrumental in the development of different metrics to review acuity and influence that uplift. But we're absolutely there and have got full support of the executive team in terms of that uplift and it's the right thing to do. Thank you, Rihanna. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, on a similar point, Anne, really, about the, the um, community issues. I mean, I think it's it's, it's really good to see that we're extending the principles of the Act in, into the community, taking it wider than the hospital setting. Uh, particularly um, keen to see what 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 uh, talking about district nursing, for example. I mean, I think the district nursing service at times is a bit un, unsung in many respects. I mean, I think the I think the whole service is is absolutely paramount to what we do in the community. Um, and I, I, I guess the answer to it has to be how we how we upskill some people. Um, in a similar way that we've just heard about in terms of the hospital setting, for example, some of those skills are transferable to the community. And I think the whole key to this is how we integrate our district nursing service with our domiciliary care services. I mean, it's um, I mean, the whole kind of landscape is, is absolutely begging for some innovative work um, around that. Um, and also, it's good to see that we are also going to look at um, the, the act principles being extended to care homes. Mm -hmm. Of course, that will be a different type of challenge for us, and we will need to look at how we factor that into our joint commissioning across the board, if that is going to be a reality, because, of course, there will 
there will clearly be a cost to that. Um, and, and, and that will need to be a whole system cost, really. But um, I, I really welcome the fact that we're now extending the whole thing um, because that can only be good for our end users, which are our patients and citizens. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Phil. I think probably one thing that um, I would want to flag is some of the work that we've been doing in terms of the role of um, volunteers. We're absolutely looking at the role of volunteers within the community setting as well. And Joe Weber, who's the divisional nurse for uh, community and primary care, really engaged with Tanya Strange and our person-centred care team to look at the role of volunteers. We, we, we've talked a little bit and we've heard today about loneliness within our hospitals, um, but that has been absolutely Absolutely a factor within the community as well. So I think that we've got what watch this space. I think um, lot lots to do and lot lots of exciting work. Um, and I agree with you in terms of working more collaboratively with other partners in social care. And we've seen some examples of that within complex care at home. Um, and I think lot lots to to work on and to develop further. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, uh, Paul. I just could, was going to raise really what whether there's been any impact of technology with regard to workloads. I mean, I was in teaching and, and uh, you know, it took us a while to, to make sure that we the admin tasks were taken out of teaching. So we actually were able to deal with the, our core work. But with regard to meetings and things now, with the virtual meetings, that should save a lot of time for some people if you have, do get people together for meetings, etc. But record keeping as well. So I just wondered, um, has anything been done on the sort of training development and the and the impact of technology because the one thing the pandemic has done is to move the virtual world into a into sort of the uh into current times really because i think we were we were sort of um quite a quite a way behind so anything on the impact of technology and whether that can make a difference rihanna yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Paul. A really important point. Um, I, I think we've got more to go at in this arena. Um, and I think that's a key part of our um, digital strategy, really, from a health board perspective. Um, we, we've got some great examples. District Nursing are just introducing Malinko, which is a, a scheduling tool. It's just uh, transformed some of the teams in Newport that have been testing this um, and just helped enormously with their workload management, uh, which has a positive impact in terms of patient care and patient outcomes. There's definitely work on um, digital and I'm absolutely delighted to share that um, this health board has been uh, the recipient of five did Florence Nightingale digital scholarships. Um, uh, one, the only health board in Wales has got multiple uh, scholars. Um, they are currently going through their programme um, and they, with some brilliant ideas in terms of what we can do and how we can use technology and we, we can share some of that going forward. Um, we, we have regular sessions through the nursing leadership team meeting but some great work going on I, I think this space um, we need to step into more is in terms of um, digital and um, patient care directly I, I think there's lots that we could learn from industry um, and I think that's the a next exciting step so uh, yeah again watch this space I think that's great great to hear thank you Anne thank, thanks Rhiannon and I think that uh, this is all extremely positive um, I just want to know, basically, in your opinion, how difficult do you think the next steps will be to achieve? Thank you, Chair. Next steps in terms of the report and what we need to do around the Act no, or next in terms steps? More the broadly? extension of the Act. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to create a lot of work, um, but with the right outcomes eventually. I think my my reflections on the Act and its extensions, and I'm not quite sure what the agenda will be going forward with the um, Welsh Government um, and the Senate, but um, I, I think that um, I'm in a privileged position of being the chair of the steering group for the Quality and Engagement Act and its implementation across Wales. And um, One of my reflections is that our focus on implementation but ensuring that we've got the right tools and systems in place in order to gather the information that we need to demonstrate uh, compliance. Uh, the one thing in terms of the, the Nurse Staffing Wales Levels Act from my perspective is that we just didn't have the systems in place to gather the information. You'll see from the report that we're now working on how we'll have a national system to ensure that the staffing is um, as rostered. Um, 
really, and in, in perhaps an ideal world, that should have been in place before the Act was implemented, because um, otherwise it's just created so much work for individual organisations. It is important work, but I think it's, it's a lot of work. Um, the amount of effort that goes into um, analysing the acuity audit, the metrics, um, the triangulated approach, uh, that's been hard work across the medical and surgical wards. We'll have that for um, inpatient paediatrics um, and that will spread to other areas. I'm not sure about the timetable, but additionally, I think the Act always focuses or a lot of the Welsh Government directives focus on hospitals uh, and yet the majority of care provision is in the community. So I am pleased to see the focus on district nursing. Um, I just got a little bit of nervousness that that focus is a bit of a historical model rather than a transformational model, which is what we will need to see in community. So it will be challenging. Thank you. And I'm sure you're in a very good position to be able to influence the thinking for the future as well. Which Not least with a new chief nursing officer arriving in the yeah. autumn. So absolutely. Yeah, thank well, you. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Rhiannon, and, and, and your team. It's it's really hard work for everybody, but it is very important plank in our evaluation of the quality uh, that we can uh, provide to patients. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions... Might we? Uh, oh, Paul's got his hand up. Have you, have you got your hand up? What? No, it's a legacy hand. Sorry. Oh, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's all right. Um, could we move on to the uh, South East Wales Vascular Network outcome of engagement, please, Nicola? Yeah, Borada, uh, Paub. Um, yeah, they're pleased to present the vascular engagement outcome. The paper provides an overview of the outcome of that public engagement process that was undertaken um, in relation to the development of a regional model for vascular services involving an Iron Bevan Health Board, Comtaf Morganu, Cardiff and Vale and Powys. Um, and we're all quite familiar with this case, looking to improve sustainability of vascular services in the region um, and aim to improve outcomes for our patients. Um, this involves very much a centralised hub um, for vascular surgery at University Hospital of Wales, supported by spoke hospitals across Cardiff and Vale, Cuntaf, Morganogan and Iron Bevan. Um, there was an eight week engagement process, which I know you were all cited on previously, that ran between the 19th of February to the 16th of April and took very much a blended approach, recognising the, the limitations on face to face engagement at the minute. We used online surveys, virtual meetings, um, discussions with internal stakeholders um, and was being seen as a very good comprehensive engagement process. Um, 110 people responded. There's a detailed report attached in the supplementary papers you should have seen. 110 people responded to the survey with 72% of people agreeing with the evidence and the case for improvement in the outcomes. Um, you can see from the document a number of themes have emerged um, particularly around transport and understanding the difference of care between the hub and the spoke and how that model will work. Um, so it's very helpful to get that feedback from the public and stakeholders, which will help us strengthen the service development plans as we move forward. Um, it is pleased to report that all community health councils have agreed that we do not need to move to a public consultation um, stage, that they are content with the engagement process, but that we should run in parallel with the next stages in terms of addressing some of those particular areas and those themes that came out of the engagement process, which is what um, was agreed. And that was consistent across all the community health councils um, at Anaira Bevan, Cardiff, Cuntaf, Morganog and Powys. So it's really good to be in that consistent position. Um, so that decision will enable us now to very much progress with the development and finalisation of the business case, which is the key next step. And as you'll see, it, was, it is scheduled for the boards in July, all being well. Um, and the business case is going to be a key document for us now in terms of understanding our baseline position and the benefits case um, that underpins a centralised model to understand what difference that will make to our population. The workforce and financial implications in particular are going to be um, quite key, particularly around workforce recruitment. And then the operational readiness work to help inform um, an achievable timeline for implementation in the context of the work that we need to do um, to, to be ready to 
implement that model. So I think overall it's been a, an excellent piece of work and um, it's been great teamwork actually across the region um, with, you know, as well as the health boards, the community health councils, clinical operational teams have worked really well and the public and um, and the board on that basis is is asked to note the, um, the outcome of that um, report that is attached um, to consider the views of the Community Health Council and their agreement to um, to go to the engagement with parallel discussions, um, approve the use of the engagement feedback to inform the implementation now of the of the business case, um, and approve the recommendation to proceed without public consultation as set out in the paper. Thank you, Chair Diol. Thank, thank you very much, Nicola. Paul. Um, just to support what Nicola has said with regard to moving to the next stage, I mean, I think it is high time we had the review of vascular services and actually I've been greatly impressed with the uh, the activity that's been involved with regard to that. And Ira and Bevan, in terms of its um, engagement and involvement in that, I think has led on the engagement across the, the region and has done a superb piece of work. The outcome is very pragmatic. It's option two choice, which is sort of to go ahead, but there's some things that some more information required, and that makes a huge amount of sense to give that, that sort of back sort of information back to the feedback back to the public um, and then of course we've got the report in July so I think bearing in mind where we were six months ago I think we've moved on this tremendously and I think um, let's let's get this sort of actioned and agreed uh, because at the end of the day I think we'll make a big difference to the, mm -hmm. the public but what we need to do is make sure the public are with us with next to understand the next stage really so yeah, yeah. I would support the what's proposed and um, if you need a proposal and, and then I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Tish? Thank you, Chair. Um, an enormous amount of work gone into this and it, you know, and very, very comprehensive. So so well done on that. I'm just um I've just noted that we have barely any um any responses from minority ethnic communities, and that that is a bit disappointing given the amount of work that you put put in and that it's you know it really has been very comprehensive and I'm just wondering what we can what we can do around that and um and perhaps linking in with some of the the new the new networks that have have sprung up um through the COVID pandemic to reach some of those uh, minority groups but that's not to take away from the amount of work that, that has been put in. I'm just, um, I, I was just slightly sad to, to note that. Yeah, thanks, Tish, and, I, and we pick that up in terms of, I know in the past, sometimes we've done some targeted work um, with those communities. So maybe that's something we can pick up as we follow up on some of the themes or particularly we'll learn, you know, think about different ways we can um, access those communities for future events as well. Thank you, Judith. Uh, yes, I was just going to come in on that point because our communications team has been um, very proactive in recent months to establish a specific um, engagement group with our BAME community. So for future events, we'll be able to reach into that group. They're very proactive and keen to engage uh, with the health board on a whole range of uh, a whole range of activities. So um, I think they'll be ready made for future uh, engagement and consultation uh, efforts by us. So thank you, Tish, for raising that. Well Thanks, Tish. Thank you, Judith. Are there any further comments? Um, thank you for, for those questions. Um, I chair this programme uh, board and I have to say the teams across across the health boards have worked really, really well together to come up with solutions, including the clinical medical staff. They have been really good. And we have a couple of outstanding things which to which Nicola has referred. But um, with the cooperation of the CHC and their active involvement, mm. uh, I think we've done very well to get to this point after such a very, very long time that it's it's just sat as a, an outline decision, but uh, I have to pay tribute to the teams, the planning teams and the programme uh, director uh, for really pushing hard uh, to, to get us to this stage uh, so that we can enact an improvement in patient care. So we're happy to endorse the recommendations that you've made within that uh, paper, please, Nicola, and we will have the business case 
subject to any final hiccups, which hopefully won't occur, in July. OK, yeah, yeah. and thank you very much, uh, Gemma, to you on behalf of the CHC yeah. for your very helpful handling of, of the uh, engagement that has been taking place in the Inara and Bevan area and with Powys. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on we go to transforming adult mental health services and consultation and engagement. Nick. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, Ian Thomas has um, joined us this morning, who's the general manager of mental health services. So um, I thought I'd just give a brief introduction to the work that we've undertaken here, and then Ian will take us through some of the the detailed findings from the public engagement. So board colleagues will be aware that we we brought last autumn um, a plan around that, that was based really around the, the health board's clinical future strategy to reshape and remodel the way in which we deliver adult mental health services, um, picking up that the, the three key points that are laid out within clinical futures around delivery of care closer to people's homes, creating that network of local services and centralising the more specialist inpatient services. So we we came to the board with a proposal to undertake a uh, an engagement exercise on adult mental health services, which um, we've we've now conducted over the period uh, early part of this year, um, and obviously now analysed that that engagement and and the results from the consultation exercises that we've done. Um, so Ian will, will take us through the the findings. I think it's important to state that this is going to the CHC. Um, committee tomorrow, I think it is, Gemma. I can see you nodding, so I presume I've got the date right, um, where we'll discuss that with them and then obviously agree the next steps, if you like, in terms of um, further engagement or consultation. So this really is the results of the engagement, and I'll, I'll come back in when Ian's finished talking to just go through the, the sort of recommendations and key findings from that engagement. So over to you, uh, Mr Thomas. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, obviously, th thanks for the opportunity to um, to, to present uh, the outcome of the engagement. Um, obviously, the engagement's been undertaken in very atypical times um, due to the pandemic, and so there, there's been a real challenge in in making sure that it's been meaningful um, in a very different environment, a very virtual world. Um, this has been an exercise, uh, a, a kind of different experience for. People like me who had to do lots of presentations in a very strange way uh, and also for our stakeholders and the public as well. Uh, however, in, in a strange way on reflection, it's probably enabled us to reach out to a, a much wider audience um, virtually and, and in face to face in a virtual way uh, than traditionally we've ever done before. So um, I, I think um, what we tried to outline in the report is obviously highlight the scope of the engagement, which was transforming our adult mental health services, as Nick has highlighted, with a focus on four particular areas, um, foundation tier, our primary care mental health services, crisis services, and our specialist inpatient services. Uh, however, we did take the opportunity as part of the engagement to ask people for their broader views on our mental health services as well. And some of those kind of themes are are reflected in this report as well. Um, the approach we took is, is kind of, I'm not going to go through, you'll be delighted to know, I will go through the, the report in detail. No, we but have we, read it. <laughs> the approach is hi highlighted in section three. Um, interestingly, there was, a, there was a slight delay in us going out to um, public engagement. Um, so we used that opportunity to undertake a kind of a large number of pre-engagement um, events, so we did 39 of those in all. Um, we formally launched on the 11th of January for six weeks, using all forms of social media, mail shots, videos, frequently asked questions, easy read, uh, fully bilingual. Um, so we, we kind of tried to use the whole armory of virtual ways of, of communicating that we could think of. Um, and we kind of covered a quite a large number of stakeholders, public and workforce meetings. I think we, we held eight public meetings, 
uh, over different days of the week at different times of the day. Um, we held seven workforce events and 59 stakeholder events. Um, so I think we probably, um, it feels like we've done quite a lot in trying to reach out and get people's views. Um, and the feedback from the engagement we think has been really rich. I think, so in relation to the specific service changes that we described, uh, they were, there was a really high level of support for almost all aspects of the ideas and proposals and plans we um, outlined. And that kind of the quantitative scoring is just summarised in section 4.1. I guess the only area that wasn't supported by over 50% of respondents relates to the idea of a single crisis assessment admissions ward. Um, although it's worth noting that um, only 18 people were actually against the idea. But so that kind of suggests that there's a lot more in terms of discussion and formulating the ideas and communicating those ideas um, in a different way. Uh, in addition to the quantitative data, the engagements enabled us to gain some really, say, rich information um, on the broader aspects of mental health. And so some of the comments that you'll see in relation to um, uh, other aspects of our service are included very briefly in in the uh, in the document, but also are summarised in in the appendices in the thema thematic analysis that you've got as well. Uh, so, looking specifically at comments on the proposals, um, what struck us through the whole of our stakeholder and public engagement was an incredible focus and interest on the foundation tier and primary care mental health services um, aspects of our service. And I think that just reflects the environment and the time we're in where people are really worried about, I guess, the impact on the wider community of the COVID pandemic on mental health and well-being. So I think that really came out very, very strongly and broadly was very supportive of the proposals that we put forward and the ideas that we were having to, um, to develop those services. A summary of the, of the main themes and comments um, we've, I've, we've condensed in the report um, in section, um, I think it's 4.3. I, I, my, my, my version may have a different numbering system to yours. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think, and, and the last section, I, I guess, before the recommendations and next steps um, concludes a summary of some of the themes of the broader aspects of our mental health services. And some of the themes were that um, in areas such as, I think, substance misuse and in eating disorders, there were comments in relation to um, lack gaps in services um, or f future or, or further provision. There were issues of transition that came up that we should be, be doing more to get seamless transmission from when people move between services. Um, and But also there were kind of very broad positive themes coming out as well. So overall, I think uh, in, in summary, I think we've I, I think we've had a very, what I feel to be a successful uh, engagement exercise uh, using uh, every means that we could possibly think of in a very different environment to get probably some really rich and good feedback on a range of services um, that we propose to take forward. And obviously from that exercise, we've come up with some uh, assessment and conclusion, which I think Nick is now going to um, uh, take forward now. Thanks, Thank Ian. So I think, I think it's, it's fair to say that you, you, you and the division did uh, an exceptional piece of work in managing to engage in um, what was it, a really difficult time, but but as you said, we probably learned an awful lot of lessons from that in terms of how to to have that wider reach for the community. And some of the points that came out from the engagement, in particular around the foundation tier, the the psychological wellbeing work that we we've been doing, and the primary care mental health network, are, are reflected in the first three recommendations that come out of the engagement exercise and the. The, the desire to move those forward at pace as we as we move through the, the next 12 months or so. And I, just really to assure the board that all of those three programmes, um, we've, we've either put additional funding into those 
or reorganised ourselves to ensure that we are able to deliver on those three um, three recommendations in in the current year and into next year. The the development as as board colleagues know of the specialist inpatient service OBC is is on track and the work that we've done here around the engagement will enable us to to now move that forward so that we can develop fully the OBC for consideration by the board later on this year and I think it's encouraging the high level of support there was in the engagement for that specialist inpatient services unit um, so we will will obviously then uh, discuss this with the CHC about the next steps with regards to what what further engagement we need with the public prior to the the OBC and then really the final two recommendations fall around the the crisis support and adult acute inpatient service which I think we need probably to do a little bit more work in terms of understanding the the needs and, and requirements of the public alongside the services that we are able to provide in the most effective and appropriate way as we move forward. So I think what we what we've described here is a, a, a move forward with a single point of contact, but a reassessment perhaps of how we then deliver that and what the the ward configuration and service configuration looks like as as we move forward. So, so in conclusion, Chair, I think it's it's important to to note um, the the great bit of work that's been done and the and the engagement that we've had from the public and how this we can use this to shape what is a really exciting strategy from mental health as we move forward. That we've got six clear recommendations of which two or three we can take forward at pace, and the others that we can work with colleagues in CHC and elsewhere to to really for for firm up a view of how we deliver some of the adult care models and that we will continue to develop the engagement strategy as we move forward and support the improvements in the quality and delivery of services in mental health and use the platform that we've got from this engagement to help us to deliver that over the next few years. So, so that's all I was going to add, Chair. We're happy obviously to take questions and we look forward to discussing it with the CHC tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Ian, uh, very much for this report which is truly comprehensive. And I think it was really heartening to see how you'd managed to uh, meet so many people uh, in such difficult circumstances to enable you to form this view and present your recommendations today. Um, Paul and then Tiege. Yeah, I think it's some excellent work. Just one sort of question, just to be just confirmation really, in terms of re representativeness, in terms of gender, race and age, and some of the more difficult communities to access. That's been um, this. Can you confirm that you know all, all that's been sort of considered? I looked at the equality impact assessment uh, commentary, and I just wanted to be just get confirmation on that, or whether there's any any particular groups that you would need to just um, you know sort of do a bit of a deep dive into to get some more information, or, or has all that been confirmed? We we tr we tried to engage with broad range of um, stakeholders uh, in the um, BME communities as well. Yes. Um, and in, in our kind of analysis of the feedback, we've done an analysis of gender, of race, of um, uh, age as well, to try and understand who our respondents are as well. Um, I, I think there's, there's, pro uh, there's probably, um, we never do enough, I guess, in terms of trying to um, uh, communicate with the, those individuals that are either hard to um, communicate with, or um, are. And the other, the other area that we struggle with is those who could be digitally kind of excluded mm -hmm. as well. And so we we try to use our network of um, uh, carers and the network of organisations that support people with mental health problems, like the third sector to try and uh, in get them to um, engage as well. So it, it is an ongoing kind of uh, um, feast, really, updating the quality impact assessment. I'm sure there is more we can do, um, but I think we've tried within this uh, um, engagement to kind of engage out in all areas. 
No, that's really encouraging. And I think, you know, well done for that. I looked at the list of groups. I thought it was incredible amount of comprehensive work. But it, as long as there's been a representative sort of feedback to you and, and on the basis of the evidence you've got, you feel you can move forward, then I've got no problems at all. And I think well done. But I just wanted to just just to look at that particular area. And I think there's, you've offered some reassurance. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Tish and then Emrys. Thank you, Anne. <coughs> um, thank you, Ian. A very comprehensive piece of work. I think it's excellent. So well done on, on that. I'd just like to focus quickly on the um, foundation tier. Um, and it's and it's really, it, as you say, that the observation that people are, um, are thinking much more about their mental health through the pandemic and the you know, linked to the uh, it's okay to not be okay uh, conversations. Um, and, and that's really helpful given that um, this is all part of our um, clin clinical future strategy for some years, hasn't it? That that we, we invest in, in population health, uh, whether it's physical or mental health. Um, I'm just wondering how we're going to maximise um, the partnerships and the third sector input at that level, um, because oftentimes it is in the community and with uh, organisations that people can relate to that um, that people will get, um, you know, are uh, most likely to seek uh, help and connect with. Um, I just want to ensure that um, we we continue with our partnership working at that level and, and maximise that. So I think I think it's fair to say, Teach, that we've we've got quite a comprehensive um, set of arrangements with regards to a number of third sector organisations that have been probably bolstered through the pandemic in terms of both the funding that's gone in and the work that's been done with them and a number of new pieces of work in particular with MIND um, that, that have really helped cement the sort of place of the, some of the third sector organisations within the communities and then linking that to the compassionate communities work which has continued to develop throughout the pandemic um, across a number of the boroughs again has, has allowed us really to, to I suppose it's organically developing as we move forward in terms of what that network of of support and arrangements looks like and linking it then into those psychological well-being practitioners that are occupying you know slots within all of our GP surgeries and, and are able to then direct and refer people into whether it be third sector or, or health service provision really does start to build that that tier and uh, of enabled support that we we need to have so we've you know the PWPs have been exceptionally uh, well received, and and have, you know, we're now looking to further expand that workforce. And you know the the enthusiasm that a number of GP practices and and, and local areas have for the compassionate communities model and linking all of this together, it, I think potentially makes a huge difference as we as we move forward. And we're we're encouraging further development of that through both the mental health ring fence monies that have come to us this year, but also in terms of how we're modeling our primary care services through the place-based care work that we're doing in, you know, across the RPB footprint. So I absolutely uh, agree with your point, Alec, but I think we are, and it is gradual, taking those steps that are needed to embed that fully in communities. Thank you, Nick. Emrys. Mr. Chair, yeah, just, I just, uh, the key point I want to make to the board is, to, and what our presentation is, is that um, the proposal that's been shared with us previous about modernising mental health services and the new model is obviously, it, it, from the feedback that we've had in this consultation, it's the right model that we need to be taking forward in our um, in our patch. And it certainly reflects national guidelines as well, but I, I think the way it's been localised here is is pretty impressive. The key points of note, though, for me were around um, we just need to keep an eye on the tier zero, the foundation tier, is it? because this is where demands could increase quite significantly, and particularly post-pandemic as well. It could be a lot more people coming through there, particularly with things like uh, anxiety and, uh, and depression. 
And then the, th the other point I want to make was around demand. Really, is that uh, it's demand that's going to inf uh, that's going to help inform how how we take our model forward. And one of the th one of the key points to note here is as we get our crisis services right, and we're doing really well on that, as I can see. Um, is that the um, there may not be the need for as many crisis admissions into inpatient units because we will have a more informed multidisciplinary multi-agency approach in the the community and the last one which is another key point there and I know T said the same thing here and Nick's responded to that is is that it's not all for health to do we require a multidisciplinary and multi-agency response to this to inform agencies because we don't want to uh, use unnecessary the, our specialist skills to deal with uh, um, a, a demand that requires a different type of response. But I think it's an excellent presentation and, and excellent to hear that positive feedback. Thank you very much, Emrys. I think we'd all endorse that. Are there any further questions to the team? If not, then uh, Nick, can you just re-emphasise the next steps? So, yeah, so we, we, as I say, we're going to CHC um, tomorrow to discuss the findings of the engagement. Once we've had that discussion, we'll then pull together a proposal around next steps in terms of the, I suppose, the adult work and the um, specialist inpatient service unit, and then bring back a decision as to whether or need we, we need further engagement or consultation yeah. on the changes that are proposed. Thank you. What I might be saying at this meeting, to be honest, but let me reassure everybody from on, in the board and at senior level that I have nothing but complimentary uh, discussions to have on the work that we have been doing throughout this pandemic. Uh, it has been an extraordinary last, well, year and a bit now, to be perfectly honest, and I have nothing but admiration and uh, compassion for the people who have been having to deal with this uh, alongside the partnership working that we have been doing in uh, these extraordinary circumstances. Uh, I think that the support we've given to staff has been other other health boards probably could take a leaf out of our book. Let's be crystal clear on that. Uh, some of the horror stories I heard in other areas. I'm not saying we're perfect by any means of the imagination, but I think we are, you know, a hell of a way up, up the scale for that level, to be honest. There are, I, I'd be wrong of me not to highlight that there are some areas of concern, some hotspots. Uh, mm -hmm. They are still there. Uh, we are trying to deal with them. But I would say that without the support from both yourself and uh, the chief executive and the majority of the board that we've been involved with over the over the period of time, uh, we would be nowhere near as close as we are to resolving those problems. I, I won't go through the paper. I will uh, take any comments or questions if people want to raise. Thank you very much, George, and thank you very much for that endorsement, uh, uh, which we would all accept. And we do have good, positive, robust working relationships with you and and the trades union partnership team which are invaluable in terms of taking forward a better environment for our staff so don't worry about what you're going to say <laughs> it's all important no um, I'll have Geraint, Judith and Rhiannon. Diolch Chair, um, thank you George for, uh, for the paper um, I, I have to agree with your, your assessment in terms of um, the past 12 months. Um, opening the, the Grange Hospital four months early ahead of schedule at the, at the onset of winter in the middle of a pandemic, um, um, I think is a testament to how strong our, our working relationships are with, with staff side. So you're right, I think that, you know, there are things that need some improvement. Things are not perfect. And I guess you know, in an organization employing 14,000 plus people, it will net, you know, there will always be issues. It's the nature of, uh, you know, managing um, a large organization and lots of people. Um, but um, if I look back over the past 12 months, Chair, I would say that there, there are many things that could have gone wrong, <laughs> um, but they didn't. Uh, and that, I think, is due in, in large part to the positive contribution of staff side um throughout that journey and in particular i think a, a shared commitment to our one of our fundamental values which is to put people first mm -hmm. so we tried to do everything we could together in partnership but through a lens of putting people first in determining our you know, our course of, you know our plans and our course of action and i think that certainly paid dividends 
But yeah, from my perspective as, as workforce director, you know, a really positive working relationship with staff side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geraint. Judith and then Rhiannon. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I absolutely agree and echo everything Geraint has said. Um, but um, as uh, co-chair of the Staff uh, Partnership Forum, I just really wanted to um, acknowledge George's personal contribution to what we've achieved over the last year. It's not easy to be the chair of the staff side. Uh, it brings all sorts of um, uh, dilemmas. Um, uh, and um, I have to say that um, uh, the way in which he contributes um, to that role and delivers that role um, is uh, exceptional and we wouldn't have achieved um, all the things we achieved in the last year without him uh, in that role. So I absolutely agree about the working relationship with staff side, absolutely agree with everything George has said, but I do think it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge George's personal contribution to that as well. So thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Judith, and we would all thoroughly endorse that. Thank you. Rhiannon? Yeah, th thank you. Um, my thoughts are since joining the health board um, and having worked here previously, the evolution of the partnership forum was was really stark. I could see the difference in that relationship and the approach It's one that I would describe as um, constructive challenge, uh, but with support. Um, and I, I've always enjoyed the relationship, e even though sometimes I think, oh, well, it's a, George and I do have an, a number of conversations. I did just want to flag, though, a special thanks to the Partnership Forum for their absolute support for the core care team model and the approach that we were taking with the development of the assistant practitioners. Um, I, I, I was I, I was somewhat nervous about whether there would be a, a positive reaction and uh, and it was tremendous support. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. It's not necessarily referenced within the, the paper. Um, but just to say what is in there in terms of the future work programme is the focus on um, investigations and the experience um, in terms of investigating officers. And, and I am pleased to see that focus because um, I met yesterday with an individual who, who's had quite a a challenging experience as, as an individual who's been in uh, central to an investigation being investigated um, and I just thought that staff experience was so powerful in terms of uh, showing us that we're not quite getting it right with all the goodwill and intention we're not getting it right and the emotional impact of this experience for people I don't think it's just during either a suspension or when an investigation is ongoing but lives with them for a long time after so I'll welcome the the the, the, the collaborative working around some solutions to that. Uh, thanks, George. Thanks, Jay. Thank you very much, uh, Rhiannon. Geraint? Just a quick point there, Chair, just to follow on uh, what Rhiannon has said. Um, Dr Adrian Neal is actually doing a piece of research around that specific issue about mm -hmm. how we manage HR processes, um, such as, you know, disciplinary processes, and the effect that that has on uh, on, on people. And I think that is, I know there's a significant amount of interest uh, on that subject around, across Wales. So um, we'll be develop, developing that in an Iron Bevan and we'll be taking that the, res, the results of that research um, out across the, the rest of the health boards. Good. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that, Geraint. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no further comments, thank you very much. And we endorse everything that everybody has said, George. There are a number of issues that are within this report such as the identifying of hotspots and concerns and then further staff well-being that we would look to the um, PIPA's People and Culture Committee to ensure that they're well cited on uh, and take forward. But um, thank you very much for that because it gives us again a very uh, different insight into how the organisation is working and unfortunately one that is complementary to the views that we gather ourselves. So, George, final view? Well, I, I, I was overwhelmed by those comments, to be fair, and some of them a tear to myself. Ah. <laughs> and, and thank you for those comments. Uh, I, I've, I've always tried to encourage working together to find a resolution. It's okay to throw stones at things, but it's finding the resolution is the difficult bit, but I, I do endeavour to ensure that all trade unions, and I couldn't do it without... Their support as well to people who've done us. Um, 
but yeah, it it's it's it hasn't been easy for all concerned, and uh, you know we are hopefully over the hump of it, and we know okay, there's there's due to be another surge or whatever, but hopefully we can deal with that and uh, we can we can get through that uh, issue. I, I do know that and that Sarah's got a hand up as well, so I, I will pull back from there. But can I also say before I do log off is is the fact that. Um, with the years delay, I would have, would have liked to wish the people who have left over the over the period the best wishes, and also the ones that are coming on stream and and the ones who will be leaving actually in the next year to wish them all the best, and the ones who are coming on stream and the ones who will be taking other places wish them all the best in the future themselves. Thanks ever so much, George, and keep going with the good work and testing us to make sure we're doing things right. Um, Sarah, have you got your hand up or have you put it in the chat bar? Um, well, I did I both. Thank you, Chair. I, but it, cause I would, uh, well, um, you know, on top of everything else this year, we have had the challenge of introducing the smoke-free legislation. And George is a key member of the, of the group that I chair. And I just wanted to say how much I value George's uh, constructive approach we we meet virtually but i'm always looking at him carefully to see whether i'm pushing it too far or not and um, mm. and and it's been huge but again george as others have said your your personal contribution i've, I've greatly valued it thank you thank, thank you sarah thank you. and just as a post note uh, it doesn't mean to say that george doesn't push us really hard with his team so, you know, and that's what we expect you to do. And you do it very well. So it's 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 uh, it's challenging and quite rightly it should be. So thanks ever so much, George, and your team. And we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Might we return to pharmaceutical needs assessment, Sarah, please? Thank you, Chair. And I'm uh, grateful for John Sims joining um to answer any questions about the technicality of the pharmaceutical needs assessment. I wanted just to start, though, the context is in the cover report, but I think the context is quite important. So the, the, the it, it's a legal requirement under the Public Health Wales Act, uh, but its starting point is very much a regulatory one for commissioning community pharmacy that needs to withstand the, the test of legal challenge by large pharmaceutical companies. But if you know, the approach that we've taken is that if we're going to do it, well, let's have a clear view about where we want to be in five years time with community pharmacy and how it fits with our wider health board strategy to deliver care closer to home and the, and the wide range of services that pharmacies potentially could use. So it's been a slight balancing act um, and what and today you have the draft for formal consultation and you'll see in the cover report that we are acknowledging that um, as a board we have a, a duty under the socio we have the socio-economic duty to consider now I think with community pharmacy that is very pertinent and so as well as the formal legal requirement in terms of the list of consultees, we are going to use the Integrated Wellbeing Network programme contacts to make sure we reach communities who may not um, always engage with, with a formal consultation on a pharmaceutical needs assessment. Uh, I guess similar to the conversation we've just had about transforming adult mental health services. Um, so the request today is to approve the draft for formal consultation and then the final version will come back to the board for approval in September. So Thanks. I think uh, I, John may wish to add some detail but um, I think at that point we'd be happy to take questions. Okay, John do you want to add anything? Yes thanks Chair. Um, as Sarah said really I think the the big thing to recognise here is this allows us to sort of plan the delivery of our pharmaceutical services. For those of you that may have been involved in the past with 
pharmaceutical services application committees, often it would have been pharmacists putting in prospective applications, but in the future it will be applications for where we feel there's a significant need, um, either through new developments or where services aren't being provided by our existing contractors and we want them to. So it really does put the, um, you know, the onus on us to plan our services um, going forward. Thank you, John. Are there any questions, Pippa? Uh, yes, I, I was really interested actually to read this because um, plainly the, the report's been uh, produced in reaction to um, legal responsibilities, but it's a real opportunity. And I think, um, I think the paper reflected the fact that we're taking it as an opportunity to look to the future. And, um, and obviously, you know, it means that we're able to provide better care co closer to home. We know that the pharmacies do an amazing job. So it was something that um, when I read through it, I was I was really pleased to see some of particularly the advanced services that um, have the potential to be offered. And there were just one or two things that I thought I I was just kind of wondering in my mind about, well, what services uh, do I think my community would like to access uh, from community pharmacy? And what did I think? Was there anything missing from the report? And I think there were two things that I, I picked up on. The one was um, that if the uh, advanced pharmacies are going to be offering better care for stoma patients, then should there be something for uh, continent services provided by local pharmacies rather than directly through the continent's clinic service? So I, I don't know whether that's a question that we should be considering about the link between those. And um, the other thing was, around, um, and, and Sarah will, will expect me to say this, around healthy weight resources and uh, whether they can be provided through local pharmacies. And I, and I think it is mentioned, but I wondered if it should just be highlighted uh, a little bit more. But I, I, I want to say um, it, it's great. I'm really glad to see this. So thanks very much. Thank you, Pippa. Paul? And just as I applaud this initiative and the world that's been undertaken, I mean, I think that having a you know, as sort of as much as possible that can be delivered locally, uh, and and avoid sort of contacting the GP surgery, for example, um, and uh, empowering people to go and find out more or to have ac be able to access more locally, I think is great. And uh, the more we can do this, the better, because at the end of the day, it gives access to information and facilities and materials and medication. You know, basically go go down to the local village. And, and finding out more. So the more enhanced facilities that are available, the better. Again, it, it would what would also mean that people wouldn't have to travel distances. When you look at it, it's, it's an all-win situation. So, um, and I know that the um, from the community's point of view, the more that's available locally that people can access, the better. So uh, the more that can be done, the more can be opened up, the better. So I would applaud this initiative and support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Chris and then Shelley. Yeah, thank you uh, both for the, the presentation. The, the issue I just wanted to raise was in the past there's been, and, and I, I like others, I welcome the trying to get more out of our community pharmacist service. My issue is around medication review, which I think has been uh, an area that's been um, a, a problem, I think, um, from my personal knowledge and I just wondered there wasn't a lot in the report about that and I just wonder where we saw the role of pharmacy community pharmacists in medication review uh, picking up on Paul's point about supporting GPs particularly in that area John you want to bring that up now yeah um thanks Chris um you, you'll, you'll be aware, Chris, that there has been a service called a, a medicines use review, which is more about a concordance and understanding review than a full clinical review because the community pharmacist wouldn't necessarily have access to um, biochemistry results or the types of things that would be needed. Um, that service is currently suspended as part of the COVID restrictions. But one of the one of the schemes that we have had approval of this week um, in terms of recovery money is community pharmacies doing a, a structured medication review in care homes to try and get that up and running. So that, that's something that we're looking to introduce. Um, 
we have got some community pharmacists that work with a sort of portfolio arrangement with our GP practices in our clusters. But as a as a actual enhanced service, there isn't a specific medication review service currently available other than the care home element with community pharmacy. I think as we're going to see more pharmacists going through independent prescribing training, and we've got some examples of that coming on, that then allows those additional clinical skills to come in to support the wider medication review process. So that's certainly something that we've started to develop. We've got additional IP places allocated to community pharmacies this year, 11 additional places, and that is certainly the ambition and the direction of travel that we want to go. Thank you. Okay, Chris? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, yeah, I just again, like everyone else, I really welcome this, and I think it's a, a you know it's a fantastic way to go forward. My only query is in relation to how we're going to actually get patients to change their mindset and actually go to the pharmacist. Um, you know, I know that they they do many of these services already, but I think people tend to fall back to the doctor's surgery. So I suppose as part of that, the consultation and then the implementation, I think we need to be very clear about how we're going to um, encourage people to use that service um, which usually is going to be much a much quicker service and, and probably uh, just as effective um, so I just wondered I don't know if that's I, I can't see that as I know you're consulting patients but um, I do think that's going to be an important part of the take-up. If I may chair um, so we've got a slight catch-22 at the moment Shelley because we've got variation between pharmacies in terms of what they provide. So part of this needs assessment is to be clear in setting our expectations of what we expect to be provided over a reasonable period of time. Because at that point, we can then have a much broader public campaign about what they should, you know, what they should be able to expect. And, uh, and so, whereas at the moment, so it, we're in a some do, some don't situation, mm -hmm. which makes it more difficult to have a broader public conversation. Yeah, right. OK, Phil? Look, I just say, Chair, I think this is a real step forward in, in terms of how we plan pharmacies. Yeah. Having been a previous chair of the Pharmaceutical Applications Committee, I could never really see any sense in that because all we were doing really was following the market. But this change, I think, is quite significant and will actually put us in the driver's seat in terms of how we plan the provision. So I think that's probably a, you know, one of the most important moves ahead in this whole report, really. Lots of other things seem, seem like common sense to me, um, but I particularly endorse that one because I think that will make life significantly more, more transparent and, and, and more actually um, uh, we will be able to plan things where we've not been able to do that for quite some time. So I welcome the report very much. Thank you, Phil. Shelley, do you have your hand up? No, no, sorry. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Well done. If, if not, um, are you happy to endorse the engagement process and the contents of this document? Yeah. yeah. And can I thank you very much because I, I found it really interesting and informative uh, as a consultation document. It was I thought it was really well produced. So thank you very much for that. And we look forward to seeing the results. Thanks very much, all. Thank you. Uh, if we could move on to the policy for managing policies. It's a bit like Yes Minister, this, but uh, the policy for managing policies. Uh, Richard? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those policies that the board uh, must approve and uh, it's... It, uh, it complies with the regulatory requirements uh, so that we provide clear guidance to our staff when they're creating policies on the content and the format of new policies. It provides a, uh, that consistency across the organisation, really, so that we're, we're all working to the same format and the same template and the content for a policy. Uh, and it's here for uh, uh, approval today uh, from the board. Thank you. Are there any comments? Shelley? Yeah, it's just one point really. If, um, I just was interested in the supplementary papers. It talks about there being um, a, a corporate register of policies which will be maintained, which I understand. I'm assuming yes. that's on the intranet. Um, so I would imagine that there will be some policies due to um, for all sorts of circumstances that will be overdue. And also we had COVID and the policies were changed 
on the hoof in a way. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but, you know, we had to change policies to to meet the circumstances. And I just wondered how we were or where we were with that currently in terms of, you know, things that might be overdue. What was the recovery programme, if you like, for that that side of the um, of the work of the, the, the health board? Yeah, we, we've already started that. We started that a, a few months ago. Uh, and you're right, we do have a list of policies. We have a number that are uh, um, out of date, uh, and a number that need revising and our work is working our way gradually through that register. We're talking to each of the, the divisions and departments and the owners of the policies and uh, um, ensuring that they will be updated uh, when they're required. We have a list of those that, that uh, I suppose we have a red, amber, green list. We have a list of those that are, that are red at the moment, and we're working with, with the owners to actually get those through the uh, policy approval process. Well, that's great. Thank you very much okay. for that. Thank you. Any further questions? We're happy to endorse this. Thank you. Uh, now, we've been going for two and a half hours. Would people like a 10 minute break? OK, so we'll re uh, reform at ten, uh, five past 12. Thank you.
Um, could we move then to the items for assurance? 4-1, HIW review of maternity services. Uh, Rhiannon? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so over the past, well, it's a year and a half, if not more now, um, Healthcare Inspectorate Wales have conducted and now concluded their phase one review of the National Review of Maternity Services across Wales. Um, just as a reminder, this review was to provide a national picture of the quality and safety of NHS maternity services across Wales, but to also understand whether the care provided was safe and to identif identify if there was any wider learning to improve services for women and their families. This was all triggered as a result of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and the Royal College of Midwives reporting to maternity services at the then Cuntaf University Health Board, where um, serious failings in care had been identified. The phase one review um, is, is complete, as I've mentioned, and they produced an overarching report, which was completed and published in November. Um, the findings from each health board and the phase one review were analysed and they produced a composite report outlining areas of good practice and areas for improvement, a very helpful report, and it's included um, for board members as, a, as an appendice. HIW have identified quite a number of recommendations. They're both for individual health boards, but also Welsh Government for action as appropriate. Um, when that report was received, um, we've reviewed it. We've um, undertaken a formal response and that's been signed off by our executive team. And um, it was presented to the Quality and Patient Safety Committee in February for assurance and submitted to HIW in mid-February. It, it seemed pertinent in light of some of the recommendations and our actions to bring a further update to the board on this important matter. Um, I think importantly as well, not, not least that Gemma identified earlier some of the work that they've done on um, seeking the views of women and families through the pandemic on their experiences. And I think it's just important to note that it isn't just about the HIW review. We're constantly monitoring um, women's experiences and, and have noted the experience and impact of the pandemic for women that are due to give birth and are giving birth, some, some of which um, they, they've had to attend appointments on their own and um, it's had a significant impact. Many of the recommendations within the report have been actioned um, and that was mainly because it was obviously a composite report following their inspections of each of the health boards. Um, our inspections were carried out all the way back in 2019 um, and just uh, again as a reminder there were 58 recommendations from those reviews across our four sites which included Neville Hall, the Royal Gwent and then the birth centres in YYF and as Betty and Iron Bevan. And from those 58 recommendations, there were 72 actions that we'd identified. So the paper summarises the findings of the phase one review, but it also um, uh, references our, our response and the sign off process for that, as well as just giving an update on our current position in relation to compliance against those recommendations, but also um, the actions that we've agreed as part of the phase one review. As I'd identified, the, the highlights uh, are identified with themes. They've highlighted good practice, which I think is really important. Um, and just recognising this is phase one conclusion, but phase two uh, has commenced. It's uh, really important to highlight that HIW's overall view is that staff working within maternity services across Wales are extremely committed and dedicated to providing the best standard of care for women and families. And that it was evident great pride is taken in the, in the provision of services and the delivery of care. Um, it, really important to note, however, we, we still had 58 recommendations from, from their review. HIW stated their belief that the quality of care is good across maternity services in Wales in general and that services are delivered in a safe and effective way. In the report, there's a table on page two which outlines the recommendations from the HIW inspections conducted locally. And I'm really pleased to be able to share that our latest review of our performance against those recommendations shows that we're 100% compliant with all those 72 um, actions that we agreed. In terms of our response to the National Phase 1 report, there are some areas where we've identified no further action is required. Some actions that will be addressed by March next year. 
Uh, and the board would have noted there's one action that was due for completion by April 21. Um, I'm pleased to confirm that this has been um, achieved and that was about the establishment of um, FGM clinics. Um, so we've got a designated consultant and clinics have been established. All of the actions are monitored through the Maternity Services Assurance Group. And as we're exiting our surge two, there will now be much greater attention over the next year on our assurance mechanisms and re-auditing compliance, just to make sure that we've said we've done it, but let's just check that we've done it and we continue to check that we've done it so there's no slippage. In terms of phase two, then, this is much more community focused. It has naturally been delayed uh, because of the pandemic, but it is commencing. And I will, of course, update the board um, in due course as that develops. Uh, happy to take any questions, Chair Diochenbaum. Thank you very much, Rhiannon. Are there any questions to Rhiannon? If not, can I just make one comment? Um, uh, I think there's a huge amount of work that we've done uh, to uh, improve further the quality of our services. And I'm sure that this, uh, this suite of recommendations was useful in moving our services to the Grange. Um, I assume in the next phase, uh, when we review how we're doing, uh, we will be looking at the Grange services and how they measure up to these criteria. Oh, absolutely, Chair. Um, it'll be a key part. So all of the recommendations that were um, directly as a result of our own inspections, which was pre-G uh, Grange opening, um, but additionally, the composite report, we will be applying all of those areas to each of our services. Um, and additionally, community services as well, because it, which is, is vitally important that we look at the learning as a whole um, and include the results that um, came from the CHC survey on, on um, women's experience. Experiences. Thank you, Rhiannon. If there are no further comments, can we thank you for this uh, comprehensive report and also thank the teams for the hard work that they have undertaken to continue to improve services and care. So thank you if you could uh, thank them for us. Um, if we could move to the board assurance framework, please, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, th this is uh, the board assurance framework. It's uh, um, a requirement of the health board to have uh, an, an, a framework in place to assure itself we've got an effective system of, of integrated governance, risk management and internal controls across the organisation. Uh, so this paper describes our approach and I think you'll recall we've had a number of sessions and board delivery uh, uh, development sessions about the approach that we've, we've taken on risk, etc. And in addition to that, it also provides the, the, the this first this year's first assessment, if you like, of the organisation's risk profile. So we've actually included that as as appendix one of of the framework. Um, there's a bit of background on uh, on on a bit of history, and obviously the purposes in terms of uh, ensuring that it, there's interdependencies with, with the, the key strategies, etc. Uh, identifying the principal risks and then the assurance for any gaps. Um, and I'll just stop there for any questions on it. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions to Richard on the board assurance framework as it stands? Well done. Good. Chris? Uh, no questions, Chair, but just to say that we, the Audit Committee considered this uh, framework um, last week, I think it was, um, and recognised that good progress is being made. Uh, I think Richard would acknowledge that the committee suggested that there was still work to do in refining it, and I think particularly around uh, linking up risk with measuring performance and being clear on when actions were complete and what impact they'd had uh, to provide assurance to the board. Uh, as a, as a, a detailed comment, I think uh, there's, there needs to be a review of the action plans because some of them have been in place for a while and I think some of them are now part of our internal control rather than a one-off action. So that's that would be the next phase of development. But the most important thing, I think, is using this, uh, the risks identified in this to uh, 
to measure performance and impact uh, over the coming period. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, well, if there are no um, if there are no questions or comments, then we will move on and endorse the board assurance framework uh, for use uh, by the board as a whole and also by the committees uh, that are relevant to those risks. OK, thank you. Uh, the finance report. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I think it's pronounced R now. Yes, it is. Um, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, welcome. Um, uh, so you've got the uh, copy of the finance report in the board papers. It covers a number of areas. Um, uh, one one of those is uh, a summary of the financial position for last year, which I don't plan to sort of cover in detail today because we will have a separate board in June to formally receive the accounts. Um, but I thought it was important just to include that in the report uh, for this board meeting. You'll see that in terms of this financial year, um, we've uh, we've sort of gone one month in, and at the end of April, we're reporting a a position of break even uh, with a forecast of break even at this stage. And there are a number of caveats to that as we go through the year. In terms of spend, the health board is still incurring quite significant workforce costs, which I think in some respects is understandable. Um, as services still respond to the impact of COVID. We talked earlier about still having to apply social distancing rules. Um, we're also seeing an increase in non-COVID demand, and that's reflected in some of our ED and urgent care performance. And at the same time, we're also restarting routine elective services. So in some respects, the workforce costs reflect that, but it will be important that as we go through the year, we look critically at how we manage things like our use of agency. And the executive team actually considered this week um, an agency reduction plan and the financial impact of that plan will be reflected in the overall financial plan and forecast going forwards. The board will remember that back in March, uh, we were required to uh, set a budget for this financial year. That's very much in line with our standing orders and SFIs. But we did that on the basis that there was still quite a lot of uncertainty around a number of things. Uh, and so we set a budget for quarter one. Uh, with the view that there would probably be uh, more work required in three broad areas. So the first one was around uh, getting greater clarity on our service and workforce assumptions as we go through the year. And I think as we understand a bit more about what COVID is likely to look like um, and how that may impact on services, we can, um, we can probably firm up some of those plans a bit more. Uh, and that will feature in the revised submission of our annual plan at the end of June. The second area then was around greater funding certainty. So we we have a pretty good idea of what the COVID funding looks like for quarter one and quarter two of this financial year. But at this stage, um, there are no clear details around what it looks like beyond that. Um, so again, we're working with Welsh Government to try and inform uh, plans and what uh, we think the financial consequences of COVID are for the second half of the year. Uh, since March, we've also had confirmation of the first tranche of our recovery funding. So this relates to the Welsh Government announcement a while ago that uh, 100 million pounds would be made available to support uh, the recovery of services and addressing backlogs um, against which we've been allocated as a health board 17 million pounds. And again, I set out in the report the broad areas that we're implementing uh, recovery plans. And what you'll see is there's a fairly whole system approach to the way that we're doing that. And I think it probably links in to some of the earlier conversations that we've had about the importance of recognising good access to mental health services. Uh, we've um, 
agreed plans around uh, use of community pharmacy. I know Jonathan mentioned uh, medication reviews for care homes. Um, we're also looking at uh, medication reviews around the use of inhaler uh, drugs, drug therapy as well. There's um, further, further plans that we're implementing around uh, improving access to community dentistry, as well as a whole range of uh, elective services as well. So um, I can talk a little bit more later about the recovery plans, but what you'll see is that we're, I think, making quite good progress on that as a health board. And in terms of that initial investment and funding, we've reflected that in our financial plans for this year. The third area then is progress around savings plans. And again, uh, I've mentioned before that it's really essential that we um, address not only the health board's financial position this year, but actually the recurrent position um, in order to put our services on a financial sound footing, but also to enable the reallocation of resources as we look to change the way that we deliver services going forwards. And what you'll see in the report is uh, those savings plans that we've identified and we have a high degree of confidence of delivering. They total about £10.7 million. Pounds. To deliver our sort of recurrent savings requirement, we need to be achieving around about £33 million. Pounds. So clearly we've got some way to go as we go through and review all of our priorities uh, and deliver the annual plan that we take those opportunities to look critically at where we can uh, deliver both savings, but also reprioritize the use of resources. Um, again, I'll just remind the board the reasons why we've got that high level of recurrent savings requirement and uh, underlying position that we need to address is for two main reasons. The first one is that the level of savings that we'd planned to deliver during last year uh, was a lot lower than uh, in actual terms. Um, and that's understandable, given that we uh, had to operate through both a, a first wave and a second wave of the pandemic. But the, we, uh, the second reason then was that we've also invested more money into the GUH and ELGH network than we'd originally planned as well. So I think our annual plan, as it currently stands, and the work that we're doing on it to resubmit that uh, in uh, June identifies some of the key priorities where we have the opportunity to save further money and also make better use of resources. So really, just to summarise, and then I'll open up for questions, I think this financial year, it's fair to say that there's a significant level of non-recurrent funding available, particularly to respond to the ongoing impact of COVID and also to support those recovery plans. But in future years, we do know that the financial outlook is likely to be quite challenging. And therefore, it is important that as a health board, we use this opportunity this year to not only start addressing some of the backlogs uh, to accessing some of our services, but also to make those services more sustainable uh, in terms of service sustainability, workforce models and financial sustainability. So I'm happy to pause there and um, take any questions. Thank you, Glenn. Pippa? Uh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, um, I was really interested to uh, see something about the um, getting it right first time and um, the proposal that this would be adopted, the approach would be adopted in Wales. Um, and I know that the English programme is, is funded by the NHS in England. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wondered what was, you know, because we have devolved healthcare, what impact that would have on us using it. So that's my kind of my first question. And the other, then the other thing is, um, do, do we, do we think that this is going to deliver, um, significant savings to us because we're not having to, and better care, of course, ultimately, if we are actually getting things right first time. So I, I don't know if you could give me some idea of time frame and a little bit more meat ar around that subject, um, if you could, thanks. 
Yeah, so in terms of the GERFT approach, I mean, uh, if you look at how it's been applied across England, I think it's um, very much a national approach. It covers uh, quite a few different services. Um, the the plan in Wales has probably been more around uh, a number of individual health boards collectively uh, agreeing that we would like to adopt this approach. Um, so I think it will be more of a, a health board led initiative in that respect. Um, I think in terms of how we perhaps resource it and lead it, I think we've got opportunities around things like the, the recovery funding to do that. Um, if you, I mean, I don't know how much you've read up on the GERFT approach and how it's been applied in England. Yes, I went, um, I went onto the website. I was, yeah. uh, I thought it was really interesting. So I have actually looked at quite a lot of yeah, it. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of really good information on there. Um, I mean, clearly, to, to apply it successfully, you, it needs to be a clinically led approach. You need to have that clinical engagement and buy in, um, not only to the approach, but to actually implementing the changes. And I mean, it looks at things like uh, variation and unwarranted uh, variation. So I think, uh, you know, the approach is about improving standards of care and uh, reducing variation in care. So from a patient perspective, it should result in better quality care. Uh, at the same time, I think it allows us to um, uh, benefit from improvements in efficiency. And I'll use that term quite widely because I think some of that may result in cash releasing savings, but I think a lot of it will be about making better use of resources. So whether that's our workforce or our facilities, it allows us to do that. Uh, and I think when you look at some of the pressures that we're facing on some of our services, what it will allow us to do is take some of that pressure off in a, in a legitimate way, because actually it's about providing better care to patients. So I think the GERFT approach provides a whole range of benefits, really. And uh, I think as um, I think as just sorry, just picking up in the sidebar, um, it is very much consistent with uh, the care aims approach. I think it also fits very well with our value based healthcare approach, really, which is about improving outcomes for patients uh, and making better use of resources. That's great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Chris, Shelley, and then Rhiannon. Thanks, Glenn. Um, you mentioned in your um, in your summary there that this is uh, an unusual, going to be an unusual year. And I've got a couple of questions and, and a comment coming out of that. So the first one is uh, a general question about how assured should the board be that uh, because it's broken even in month one, that augurs well for the the rest of the, the year. Uh, the second one is, I, I note from month one that we've used um, quite a chunk of our reserves and given 20 percent uh, and given that um the quarters two three and four are probably going to be more uncertain than quarter one i just wonder what your view was on that and the reason for that uh, and then my my comment which probably sounds like a question as well is i, I wonder whether we should reflect the uncertainty of this year in in the way in which you report the financial position to the board in terms of you mentioned this quarterly approach but i'm guessing that uh, as we move into the rest of the year some of the risks become more apparent in terms of uh, restarting some uh, services and uh, trying to tackle some of the backlogs so do you think there's an opportunity perhaps to rejig the report so it's on a quarterly risk-based ap approach? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, perhaps if I deal with the assurance uh, point or question first, I think um, I think at this stage what we know in terms of uh, funding, uh, there's a reasonable level of assurance for the first six months so we know, for instance, that we have uh, COVID funding. Uh, we have a specific allocation, about £32 million, that would support our local plans uh, around COVID for the first six months. In addition to that, we've got reasonable funding certainty around uh, some of the other 
uh, sort of COVID programmes. So within that, I talk about things like contact tracing service, mass vaccination, for which I think the funding is is uh, is certain in the first six months. I think where the uncertainty then is is beyond that six month period, um, and I think that's where we're in a currently we're in a dialogue with Welsh government about what our service and workforce plans are looking like, what the assumptions are that we think are reasonable around COVID, the likelihood of a third wave, and if so, what that might look like, and, and how uh, how we would respond as a health board. Um, so I think there's less certainty there. Uh, and I think that probably plays into your point about the quarterly approach in that um, I think at quarter two, we can probably set budgets with reasonable certainty for for quarter two but beyond that at this stage um, there is still a degree of risk I think and that risk is in understanding what our service and workforce response would be um, the level of funding that I think is available but also our progress on savings plans so we've talked about an ambitious annual plan with a lot of key priorities. I think it would be really important that we make some early progress on delivering some of those priorities during quarter two so that we've got a better idea of uh, what the rest of the year looks like and recurrently. Um, perhaps if I can just flip back to, I think, your second point, which was about uh, the high level of reserves. And I think that's probably a reflection really of um, the lack of detail around some of our service and workforce plans at this stage in that we've effectively been holding most of the COVID funding centrally as a health board. And we've allocated that on the basis of what we felt was a reasonable reflection of uh, what we would spend in month one. Um, and I think that sort of underlines the importance of having more detail around what the service and workforce plans look like as we go through the rest of the year. Um, so I don't know if that covers all of those points off. I do think that probably the quarterly approach, uh, we, we certainly need to consider whether we continue that through the rest of the year and uh, more than happy to reflect that in the board reporting as we go through the rest of the year. Chris? Yeah, that, that's helpful, Glenn. I, th I think the reserves point, it would probably be useful to, as you report in future months, just to understand a bit more about releasing reserves and what's in them. Because um, yeah. my point was really we're using 20% of the reserves in month one. Um, that on the face of it looked quite a high proportion, mm. but understand for the board to understand the rationale behind what's included in reserves and when we're going to release them would be helpful, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. but I would, uh, I, I think a quarterly approach to risk managing and reporting on finance for this year would be important. Yeah. So thanks, Glyn. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Shelley? Um, thank you. Um, my points are really around um, the, the reduction, um, the re reduction plan, the agency reduction plan, which I, obviously Glyn has covered some of that because it's gone to executive. So I suppose my question was, um, as part of that plan, do we have, do we, do we know um, what we think the likely reductions are going to be and, and how successful they will be? But bearing in mind, I appreciate that things like the workforce plan still need to do, be developed. So. Not necessarily for now, but perhaps for a future um, report, whether or not to board or to um, maybe the audit mm -hmm. committee. A little bit more detail around that and actually how realistic we are in that. That The other point which I have raised at audit committee is around retinue, which is on page uh, 306, because obviously it states there that that's sort of not being used. Um, this is the locum um, uh, methodology to, to, to get locums in. It's not being used perhaps as much as it had been anticipated, but it also says there, Glyn, that you know, the, there is an opportunity to to um, extend its use, and I just wondered again. You know, what what are the losses that we're making through that route? You know, and how? Why do we think that if we extend it, it will be used um, in more efficiently? Let's say in the future. So again, what what is the plan about encouraging people to use it, etc.? Because um, I think again, there's a um, so with some of that, it may well be down to um, pressure because you've got to get somebody in and you know somebody, um, but also you know what people have got used to so again about the refresh maybe now we're 
um, you know, coming out of hopefully um, uh, the, 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 the crisis of the, the, the pandemic. Um, and the other thing I was going to raise um, is on page 316, I think it's mentioned elsewhere in your report, is that the, the, the most significant um, financial challenge going forward um, is in relation to, um, sorry, the, the financial challenges going forward are one of the most uh, significant risks for the organisation. That's not actually part of our principal risks in our BAF. Um, and I, d I don't know where that is at the moment in terms of uh, the risk assessment and the sort of risk rating. So again, I think that perhaps we would be helpful to have a, a bit more detail on where we are with that risk. And again, I accept it's a moving feast. And again, whether that comes to board or perhaps to audit committee in future, um, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Shelley. And um, I think on the last one first, um, I think it will feature probably in the next uh, update of our risk register and BAP. Um, yeah, um, okay. but I think, um, yeah, at this stage, we were trying to sort of get some clarity around what we think the mm. the ongoing risk is as opposed to the in-year risk. Uh, so the two separate sort of slightly separate issues, if you like. Um, on the agency reduction plan, I mean, it was something that we considered in a fair amount of detail at the executive team this week. And... Um, uh, we we will effectively put a, a financial plan around that. It's quite detailed in terms of uh, assumptions and actions. Uh, and again, I mean, Re may want to come in to sort of comment on the delivery of that. But um, we'll what we will do is we'll uh, put a financial plan around the assumptions that are being made uh, in that, and then reflect that in the overall forecast for the health board. But it is quite a comprehensive reduction plan that uh, I know that uh, Ree and the team have put together. Uh, clearly, it's based on a set of assumptions. And I think, as I mentioned <laughs> before, we, we don't really know what COVID might bring no. uh, during the rest of this year. So it, it, it makes assumptions around things like service uh, pressures. Rihanna? Uh, oh, sorry, Glenn. Sorry, do you, do you want to cover that point and then I'll come back on the retinue point, if you like? Yeah, uh, for, thanks, Glenn. Th thanks, Chair. And um, thanks, Shelley, because um, I, I had put my hand up just to give a little bit more detail on, on the agency reduction plan. I probably want to start by just thanking Glenn and his team because we have taken quite a different approach to this agency reduction plan. And it is principles based as opposed to the usual approach to perhaps um, hard targets on the money. So this is about um, efficient efficiencies and effective use of resources. It's heavily caveat. Um, I think that am I confident in delivery? Absolutely confident in delivery because this is about quality and safety. It, it isn't about savings. It's about the fact that agency have played a vital role over the past year and we couldn't have managed without them. But do we want to use agency to be providing care for patients? No. Um, and that's we've had a, a very strong history of uh, reduced agency in this organisation. And it's one it's a position I want to get back to. Um, but it does need very sensitive and careful handling and um, this can't be seen as right oh, we're out of we're out of the surges now and, and now we've got to reduce agency has got to be seen in the context of a substantive workforce um, and doing all the things that we talked about earlier not, not saving money as such but focusing on quality and safety and, and I'm very pleased to, to say that that was the whole discussion in executive team and and I am grateful to Glyn and his colleagues for that um, taking that different approach which which is, which is important. Um, it is a comprehensive plan. We're, we're happy to provide greater detail at any juncture and, um, and we can sort that out outside, but we will be monitoring that very carefully through the um, Nursing Agency Workforce Group, which um, Workforce and OD and Finance support. Thank you. Thank you, Rhiannon. Uh, Glyn? Yeah, if I perhaps just come back to the, the retinue point. So this yeah. is... Um, uh, this is what's called a direct engagement model for those who are perhaps not familiar with it, where we effectively use a provider to provide a lot of our locum uh, cover. And uh, uh, we've had this arrangement in place for a short while now. Um, and really some of the benefits of doing this are that we should be able to recreate sorry, recruit more uh, locum staff, but also in doing that, potentially negotiate better rates. What we found is that with some 
some staff and some specialties, they don't necessarily want to operate through this direct engagement model. Um, and therefore, we end up uh, very often paying higher rates, uh, and sometimes it leads to recruitment problems as well. So clearly, as a health board, having signed up to this arrangement, we want to try and extend and make the best use of it uh, for a number of reasons. And obviously, one of them is financial, but actually, it's also about uh, attracting in uh, good quality locums as well. So... Um, I can't remember the timescales for the refresh, but I know that we are due to, uh, to, to to look at the contract and the arrangements. And really, I think, um, um, you know, one of the things we'll be looking to do is learn from, from our ex experience to date so that we can uh, make better use of that arrangement. But I, I think we would certainly want to extend the use of it where we can, Shelley. It, sorry, Chair, can I come back? It's not. I, I think it's a fantastic model and the direct act. I think that's really good, particularly because you can have that cohort of locums who become, you know, regulars and staff know them and all the issues we're talking about bringing on new nurses earlier, you know, and, and what have you. I mean, that that is all funded. It's just the question of, you know, the application of it. And I appreciate um, that's difficult. So I'm supportive of it, but I, I just wanted to check about the refresh, really. Thank you. Yeah, and and I take your point about. Uh, I mean, uh, you can try and persuade people to use it, but uh, at the end of the day, if you've got a yeah. a, a very hard to recruit to specialty, um, and the only way you can recruit locums is via a, a different method, um, uh, you, you're left with very little choice. But I think the longer we have this arrangement in place, the more generally people will get used to this This being the way that we, we do business with locums. Thank you, Glenn. Paul? Uh, first of all, I mean, in terms of the position statement, I'd be interested to know from um, Glenn where we are so, sort of benchmarking against other health boards. That's question one. Uh, I do think the quarterly approach is very sensible. I think when you look at uh, where we are today, Last 12 months in terms of context has been totally and utterly unique with the pandemic. We're now in recovery mode for the next 12 months, so there's currently concern, I think mentioned, mentioned earlier, about you know potential variants. So a quarterly approach seems more sensible. <clears throat> if you also look at the sort of position in uh, an Iron Bevan, we've had the remodelling with the new hospital and the remodelling of local general hospitals. We've got developments coming up with regard to Tr Tradiga, Newport East, Cancer Services, Innovation Centres, just to mention a few. Um, we are awaiting more information from Welsh Government with regards to funding because of the, 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 the recent elections. And so there's a lot happening, really. And I think the, the message I'm getting, I haven't read all the paperwork, is that we're in a quite a good place, really. And I want to thank Glyn and the team for their incredible work. But the one message I think on the second point I'd like to ask about is I think we need to move into a new gear called efficiencies and to have staff engagement with this whole um, concept, because I think um, there are opportunities, there are challenges. But with efficiencies, it gives it means that staff can have some conversations about what could be reduced without impacting the patient. So just some thoughts, really, because we're beginning to refresh uh, mode at some point and um, you know we just need to sort of think about the future uh, as part of our uh, responsibility under the future of the generations act so just thinking about those things clean really but if you could just comment on those two things that's the benchmarking and also the efficiencies i'd be most grateful yeah no thank you paul and uh, thanks for that i think you've made some really helpful points uh, there in terms of benchmarking i mean we um as health boards, we produce sort of annual costing returns. Um, and I, I mean, I probably have to caveat this when I say where we are and, and so on, because clearly benchmarking is is a very broad term in terms of the whole range of services that we provide uh, as a health board. Generally, with those costing returns, um, we're usually around about sort of second out of the seven health boards. But I mean, as I said, I'd have to caveat that quite heavily in terms of what that means, because um, the seven health boards are very different in terms of organisations, the services they provide, 
and the populations that they serve. So I think when you when you look at benchmarking information, you've got to take a number of things into account uh, when you're trying to do that. And what we tend to do is also look at benchmarking further afield, um, partly because we want to try and benchmark against the best in terms of what we're looking at. So if they were particular hospital services, we would probably benchmark ourselves against um, high performing trusts in other parts of the UK as well, rather than just limiting that to health boards. The other thing that we would probably normally do as well is look at those population areas that are similar to ours. So we might look, for instance, at uh, healthcare providers in the northeast of England because they have a similar population makeup to us. Um, so the benchmarking is. There's quite a detailed answer behind that, um, but but generally, and I would say it, it is a, a general general, we, we perform reasonably well as a health board. And I think in some re respects that's reflected in our sort of financial track record over the 10 years or so that we've been a health board, really. In terms of efficiency, I mean, um, really interesting question about how you engage staff in this. And... Um, I guess the approach that we're trying to take here really is to um, engage staff in how we deliver the best possible outcomes for patients, how we deliver high quality care. But in doing that, we make best use of the resources that are available to us. And um, I'm sure people will have heard during the course of this morning um, talking about trying to um, deliver the right workforce, um, give people the right skills, um, allow people to operate at the top of their license. And those are all the things that I think allow us to provide good quality care to patients uh, in the right setting, in the right way, and make best use of resources. And I think as part of that, drawing out where we can achieve efficiencies has to be part of the conversation, but it's got to be part of that broader conversation with staff, I think, um, if we want to engage them properly. Yeah, yeah and I, just to say, I mean, I do take on board that um, we've got a duty of care over staff as well with regards to, you know, what's happened um, and what's happening. I think that's important. I think that because Brianna Absolutely. makes a very good point as well. And I, and I think also the, the engagement side, but I think there's some opportunities there. Yeah, thank you. Are there any further questions? If not, I just have one comment to make because I know we shall return to this uh, frequently and that's about the the saving schemes and the uh, the making better use of resources. Um, and that's really that uh, I know a huge amount of work is going on in looking at this area uh, and we have made some advances already. But I think it'd be really helpful with your list on page six uh, of the uh, you making better use uh, to look at. So do we have to invest to save and what's the time scale and how, how can we achieve it and what different skills might we need to implement the changes that we're promoting? And also to look at uh, with savings, how do they mitigate or otherwise some of the risks that we have? So to tie those two together, would that be all right, Glyn? Yes, that would be fine. And um, I think that fits really well with the wider sort of plan that we're looking to deliver this year. So that, that would be great. Thanks. OK, thank you. And thank you very much for that. It is difficult because we we are, we are in uncertain times. But um, you know, I think that the work that has been done by the team and the quarterly approach uh, is a sensible one, which we would all endorse. So thank you for that. Could we go to the performance report, please? Glenn. Yep. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, again, you've got the uh, performance report in front of you. Uh, most of the measures are reported up to uh, the end of March. So it gives you a fairly good sort of uh, year end report, if you like, for last year. Um, I think probably just building on some of the themes that we've talked about earlier today and and, uh, uh, and bringing in some new ones, um, you'll see that we're gradually beginning to make some progress around some of our elective targets. Um, so 
whilst we fail, face quite a significant challenge in terms of addressing some of these backlogs, uh, I think the the work that has already started around restarting some of our routine elective services and also some of the recovery plans that uh, we're, we're now implementing uh, should see sort of further improvements against some of those elective targets. But I thought I'd um, probably just sort of mention to the board that we have very much taken a a more rounded approach to recovery. So this isn't simply just about investing a lot of money into traditional waiting list initiatives. Mm-hmm. Um, we recognise that um, in looking at patients who are currently on waiting lists, um, the level of risk of harm to some of those patients. So we have quite sophisticated <coughs> measuring and tracking of our waiting lists at the moment around the number of patients who are in different risk categories. And we've used the Royal College of Surgeon guidelines to to actually undertake those risk assessments. That's also allowed us to target some of the areas that we know that there are levels of of risk to harm to patients. So we've already uh, implemented plans around things like wet AMD uh, treatments in ophthalmology. We know this is quite a high risk area, Um, but we're also investing in some upstream services as well to, in some respects, uh, try and address some of the points that I think Paul made and and Chris earlier about this is an opportunity to not only address some of the backlogs in, in access to some of our services, but actually to change the way we deliver them. So we've agreed, um, one-off investment in areas like developing an alcohol care team, which will help us uh, provide care to patients uh, with alcohol issues. Um, Previously, uh, we've seen, you know, quite significant admissions to ED and into hospital as a result of alcohol-related issues. So again, this is about investing in services up front to try and help address and prevent uh, some of those problems before they uh, become acute issues that uh, come into secondary care. Similarly, we've agreed to invest more money into weight management services. Um, And as I think we mentioned earlier, we're investing quite significant services in into primary and community care services. So um, increasing access to community dental services, uh, increasing access to community pharmacy. Um, So again, this will help take pressure off some parts of the uh, system that are are dealing with significant level of demand at the moment. And I think similarly around mental health, we've agreed to invest um, money into uh, increasing capacity around mental health primary care services, um, uh, diagnosing autism and uh, access to psychological therapies. So there's quite a range of services and approaches that we've taken to uh, look at how we implement sort of recovery, but also I think sustainability across the, the health system. Um, I'm conscious that covers probably a number of the key indicators. So this isn't just about addressing elective waiting times, but also it's about taking pressure off our ED and urgent care system. Um, That in turn will help us then, I think, improve things like our access to stroke services. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're looking at how we increase access to some of our diagnostic work. So endoscopy, for instance, which in turn will help us with some of our cancer access times as well. So it's quite, um, it is quite a whole system picture in terms of our approach to recovery, but I think it will link in with some of the annual plan priorities that the board have signed off uh, this year as well. So um, I'm conscious there's quite a lot of detail in the report. I'm happy to take questions at this point and to go into further detail in those areas that you're particularly interested in. Thank you, Glenn. Tish? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Glenn. I, I'd like to ask a question um, about the elective care um, lists. 
But as you've said, this, this goes across further than that. And that is particularly around the clinical prioritization rather than a time-based approach. And it's actually very difficult to argue with. Um, those that are in, in the most clinical need uh, uh, need to be um, to be uh, supported first, and that is consistent with the prudent healthcare, healthcare principles. Um, but I'm just wondering how we are communicating this to patients or public and patients who are maybe on a list and expecting, and I guess rightly so, because it has been custom and practice for many years that if you sit on a list long enough, you will come to the top of the list, um, that actually we're doing things differently. Um, because it, reflecting back right at the beginning of the meeting, we had um, we had a report from the CHC around um, their feeling forgotten report. And I just am concerned that going forward, there will be many people feeling forgotten if they don't understand that uh, we are um, working differently. Yeah, uh, so there's there's probably a number of components to uh, that answer, Tish. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to say that people who are waiting for some kind of treatment or consultation, that um, at an operational level, we are in regular contact with people. Um, there are discussions about um, the time that people may have to wait for care, but also I think as we implement some of these recovery solutions, what we're trying to do is potentially offer alternatives. Um, we have also um, invested quite a lot of money in um, undertaking things like outpatient uh, reviews. So patients who are uh, currently sitting on outpatient waiting lists. Um, so we will actually uh, undertake quite a lot of work during the next few months on having those conversations with patients, but looking at what the best uh, best care or treatment is for them. So clearly this is going to take a while. Um, we know that the some of the backlogs are quite significant, but I think um, that approach aligned with having a better understanding of what the level of risk is within some of our services allows us to target our approach with those patients who are at most risk, um, but also allowing allowing us to have those conversations with them. Um, so that's I think that's at one level. Um, I think use of our internet uh, and it, oh, sorry, internet and website allows us to give people more general updates about what services are available. Now, clearly, that's more around general information for the public and patients. But I think the work at that operational level is key in having the individual conversations with patients about what is available and, and when. Uh, I'm conscious that with all of this as well, um, whilst there are a lot of people keen to address uh, the backlogs in waiting lists, we also have quite a tired workforce uh, and we do need to bear in mind the well-being of our workforce in the pace at which we can move on some of these uh, solutions as well. Thank you, Glenn. I'll bring Nick in to see if he's ha have us anything to add, but I think it would be really useful, actually, if uh, as treatment is rightly being based on need and clinical need, that uh, we could reflect that in the future in the report, um, because I think it does give an accurate, accurate more accurate uh, picture of, of how we're proceeding. Uh, to manage the health and well-being of the population. Nick, did you want yeah, to add just, something? Yeah, just thank you, uh, Chair. Just to add to Glyn's point, really, uh, but specifically around the sort of waiting list and the reviews that are likely to happen over the, the coming months, I think there's there's a desire on the behalf of um, primary care clinicians to, to look at who has been referred onto lists and how best to manage them going forward. And I think that'll be quite a key piece of work through the summer and we've talked as a, an executive and, and and locally on the ground about how we, I suppose, almost, I don't want to create a catchphrase, but how we get our population fit for the winter 
um, and some proactive approaches to reviewing people who are on lists for whether it be chronic pain, diabetes, all sorts of different conditions, I think would probably answer the question, Tej, around them being forgotten or not being forgotten and that bringing them into some form of diagnostic or clinical review to give them the, some accurate and truthful information about the length of time that they're likely to wait if they're not seen as urgent and what do we mean by urgent, I think is going to be really crucial. And so there's, you, you we're trying to form firm up a plan to sort of develop that over the next couple of weeks so that we can deliver something through the sort of the latter spring summer months to to really start to deal with this issue because this issue is not going to go away this is a five to ten year plan that we're now going to have to deliver and we need to be honest with the public and also be clear on what their expectations are but that requires an investment in preventative services as well as an investment in um treatment so i, th I think we're, we're we're on all of this it's you know we're running as fast as we can really to catch up with it i think thank you nick pippa yes thank you nick um you actually managed to answer um part of what i was going to ask so that's great um and i think there is something around the communication on what do we mean by urgent that um that could help people manage their health conditions, even if they are not on that list at the moment, if you see what I mean. So that general understanding in the population of what an emergency is, what urgent is uh, in relation to outpatients. I think all of those kind of educational things, I think, will be um, will be really useful to people. And the only challenge, of course, we have is, is in how do we reach them. Um, my question uh, um, was really directly relating to stroke patients and step down of, of stroke patients and and how how can we really make this better for people so that they don't feel that they're sitting waiting for things that could improve their lives so i noticed there was just something in the performance report about um uh delays in that and um so that kind of struck me as well but i think there's is something of the education piece in in that, but specifically, I was concerned about the stroke patients. So, thank you. Would you like me to pick up on the the, the stroke question specifically? Please. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, just, just so you know, I mean, we are, I mean, we are very concerned about the the stroke performance and how it's been affected uh, it, with sort of current circumstances. Um, the improvement plan that's been identified does look at a number of things along the stroke pathway and um, some of it will be interrelated to the wider pressures that we're seeing around um, demand for uh, the front door ED and urgent care and I think if we can start to address some of that, that will help relieve pressure on the stroke pathway um, so that we can actually implement probably more of a fast track pathway for some of our stroke patients. Um, I think there are probably other things. You talked about education training. Uh, I think one of the areas will be to make sure that all of our um, staff in ED that um, uh, manage patients who uh, present with a stroke, that they can undertake things like swallow assessments. Um, a lot of that training has already been provided, but it's probably, again, you, it's probably helpful to reinforce some of that. And then I think the point that you mentioned, Pippa, about making sure that we've got timely step down. So step down from the hyperacute uh, stroke unit in the Grange down to e ELGHs, but also where we know that perhaps their rehabilitation has progressed um, and they can then be discharged, that that step down happens effectively as well. So I think the improvement plan that we've identified recognises all of those steps and the need to, to focus on all of those. Um, but we also need to make sure that the wider system is operating effectively as well so that we can, for instance, protect some of our stroke beds and we can make sure that the right uh, capacity in our hospital system is there when we want to step patients down. And thank you, Glenn. It's really, it's really helpful because we know, don't we, that uh, um, it puts pressure on families, it puts pressure on care homes and, you know, it's actually stressful for the patient as well because they don't necessarily get the recovery that they 
they need if if all of these things don't don't take place so thanks for that thank you do you want to add to that nick no just pick up really on pippa's point about the urgency and i think uh, not wanting to sound too much like our director of uh, public health but i think we've got we've very much got to focus on getting the public to understand that actually they've got a part to play in all of this in terms of their own health and well-being and to access and you know think about their health and not just relax we are over reliant on hospital and elective style services and we've got we are going to have to educate the public in such a way that they don't think there is a solution which is just an operation or a tablet or whatever it might be for a number of conditions and that actually our responsibility as a health board obviously is from the preventative right the way through to the treatment and we've got to give some focus to that I think because we you know in the same way that we play a part on a regional partnership or a PSB level we've got to be clear that it's not only for health services to recover from the pandemic it is for social care services for third sector organisations to recover and we need to be putting as much emphasis on their recovery plans as our own I think as as partners around that table. Thank you. Emrys? Yeah, one's a, one's a comment and one's a question. In respect to the comment, it's just to echo what colleagues have said, is that we've got to get the, commu the, the, the communication right to the public around how we're managing our risks and how we're managing our demand. And, and similarly, that we've got a systems approach to this because um, this demand could increase as time goes on. So we've just got to make sure that we're on top of that. And the, the, the question was, is that um, noting uh, Glenn's comments around um, performance and waiting lists and the actions that we are taking around alternative models and sustainable practice, and similarly around the risk management of the waiting lists to make sure that we are prioritising accordingly, what might be um, helpful if there's a possibility to correlate the performance with the actions that we've taken and that we can measure that in some way? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, Emrys. And um, some of the so some of the services that we've um, supported uh, through the use of recovery funding uh, are actually based on very sound, robust business cases. Uh, some of which allow us to set a baseline against which we can measure. So, if I just think of the the alcohol liaison service. Um, that was actually undertaken as a pilot uh, a year or so ago. There's some really good data there that allows us to track progress then when we implement that properly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Chris? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, probably following on from Emerus's point, I, I think what the discussion we've had is shown that uh, what we're what we're doing uh, is uh, addressing um, patient demand and patient need in a, a different way because of the circumstances that the health board's operating in. And uh, at the moment, I don't think the performance report provides uh, uh, a commentary for the health board on that. Uh, and I recognise it's difficult, but just going back to the annual plan where we as part of that process we talked about developing an outcome framework and I suppose the question is there how how close are we to reflecting that framework in the performance report um, the, sec the second issue is um, related to, to Pippa's uh, questions and comments around stroke and the fact that we uh, aren't able to deliver or haven't been able to deliver to stroke patients in the way we want. What, what's the impact and, uh, on patients and the outcomes? And I think trying to develop an approach to that. Uh, and also what the impact on the efficient use of resources, because we're having to do things in a different way, uh, would be, be helpful. Uh, and then Thirdly, in the detail of the report, you mentioned that Welsh Government are reinstating RTT. And I just wondered whether there was any conflict in that approach with what you just described, Glyn, and adopting the needs-based uh, first approach for, um, for patients as uh, prescribed by the Royal College of Surgeons. 
Okay. Um, so I think in terms of reporting the outcome, I, I mean, I, I think in theory you're absolutely right. There, there is a potential tension between measuring the time that somebody's on a waiting list and balancing that with the level of harm that's uh, potentially occurring. Um, irrespective of the, the time they wait on the waiting list. Um, I think Welsh Government generally is supportive of us applying the risk-based approach in terms of harm to patients. So at the moment, I'm not seeing in practice any, any tension around the fact that we're focusing on uh, minimising harm to patients. OK, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, if there are no further questions, no, uh, we'll pass on then to the quarter three, quarter four performance, Nicola, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and apologies, my internet seems to be dipping in and out, so I do apologise oh, if there's yeah. any disruption. Um, okay, so I'm really pleased to present the quarter three, four report, um, trying to capture the achievements and challenges of the last six months in a succinct report, um, as you can imagine, is no easy task and um, probably one of the reasons why it was late because I just never felt like it was good enough to capture what we've all um, and the teams have been through. Um, and really quite humbling when you pull it together, I think, in terms of reflecting on what our staff um, and our communities have delivered, achieved, been through um, over the autumn and winter months as we continue to deal with the challenges of the pandemic. And um, conscious of time, I'm just going to try to, in terms of a summary, um, you know, we dealt with an increase in prevalence of COVID that started rising in those early autumn months, which took us to a kind of second wave peak in December, where we had over 600 people in our hospitals, including um, recovering patients. And it hit us particularly hard and fast in December. And I think we all recognise we didn't see the reduction in the non-COVID presentations that we've seen in the first wave. Um, which was particularly challenging. And, you know, we had to respond really quickly in those early autumn months where we've seen challenges of nosocomial transmission, which, you know, we understood better through improved testing and therefore needed to respond really quickly with new COVID pathways and a COVID implementation plan to address those um, issues that we were picking up. You know, we've mentioned it numerous times, you know, we opened our long awaited specialist critical care centre uh, four months early as part of the pandemic. Um, and it goes, you kind of reflect back and it seemed to happen so quickly after all those years of planning. Um, and our own reflections, as we've done before and as executive team is thank goodness we did, because those weeks leading up to it and what we faced in December, we all can't imagine how we would have managed without that facility um, at our disposal. Um, we maintained essential services provision across the whole system, right across primary care, community, mental health and secondary care, continuing to have to adapt and think of new innovative ways to try to meet those essential needs of patients, um, which we, you know, we did relentlessly, really. And then in the last quarter, we particularly started planning and starting to deliver our routine, more of our routine services as the COVID prevalence reduced across the hospitals. Um, in all of that, we maintained, developed um, a very agile, dynamic testing and TTP service that continued to deliver huge challenges that were put upon them. And that's without mentioning an unprecedented um, delivery of a mass vaccination programme like no other. Um, and that's just, you know, just having it as a bullet point doesn't feel like it does it justice. And amongst all of that as well, we maintained a real focus agenda. Oh, she's gone. Well, I think they can with oh, Okay, here I am. Can you hear that? Yes. Um, so that was a summary of the last six months, which hopefully you caught most of. Most um, of them. So just. So to pick up a few specific things, I, I won't mention the Grange again because we can um, go on about that for a, we've done much justice to that, I think. Um, but it's only when you think about what the actual staff who moved and the amount of time and the disruption that created is in amongst everything is really is quite um, amazing. Um, I wanted to pull out cancer services because um, this has been a key concern, um, as you know, and it is something we put significant focus on over the last six months. And, um, you know, trying to capture succinctly into the report, we 
are now back to pre-COVID levels and in fact reached the highest level on record of GP referrals in April, which is continuing into May. So we are now seeing the consequence um, of, of some of the reductions in referrals we've seen in the earlier months. But what is interesting in some of the data in re the report is despite GP referrals going down during those months, our conversion rates were higher and our number of diagnosis was actually higher than pre-COVID, which shows that GPs very much were doing a good job at selecting those highest risk patients um, and enabling us to diagnose those. And, um, and we delivered more treatments. We're now delivering more treatments of cancer than at any time pre-COVID. Again, we're trying to get through those backlogs of patients that we are worried about. Um, there are some areas we've identified where we're concerned where referrals are low because GPs are not present, uh, patients are not presenting to GPs in the same way, particularly around urology and prostate cancer is a particular concern. And we're thinking about the public messaging around that. Mm -hmm. But this is really an area where we are continuing to focus our efforts to address some of the risks we see around the, the cancer patients. But really good progress that we've made, particularly in the last few months. Um, I wanted to pull out mental health. And again, we've been doing reviews with our divisions, like touch divisional reviews, to really try to capture some of the, the last six months and some really great work in mental health around the crisis team and the implementation of the Shared Lives programme, which is helping uh, manage people who are stepping down from their um they'd acute admissions, trying to work themselves back into the community and also avoiding admissions through this pilot. So it's really good work in that area. And also the development of the Mellow Cymru website, really focusing on the well, somewhere for the communities to access for wellbeing support, recognising what the pandemic presents to many communities, as well as maintaining the strategic agenda that we heard about earlier. Um, CAMS, I thought, wanted to mention, again, didn't see any reduction in their referrals. We recognise this is a huge area of concern, particularly that we need to focus on going forward. But they really did look at innovative ways of being able to maintain their services, looking at digital solutions, single points of access um, and some really good work in that area. Uh, primary care, I wanted to pick up again, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking sometimes about hospitals and that's where it hits us. But the primary care is, is now dealing with more demand than they've seen pre-COVID, trying to juggle face to face, plus the, the virtual opportunities that are presents us and really have had to continue to be agile and responsive to the uh, changing uh the change in circumstances over the, the last six months. And that, that applies to GPs, optometry, dental and pharmacy. And I do want to apologise that as part of finalising the report, we accidentally took out a section on dental, which I will get submitted, but put back in and sent round to you all, just so you've got that for completeness. So I do apologise about that. I had We hadn't forgotten about it, it was an error. Um, I wanted to pick up urgent care system. I, I think we all know that we've seen significant pressure over the last few months in urgent care at the same time that we are trying to embed our new system model with the Grange opening and, and the use of our ELGHs. Um, and I think what we've particularly seen in the last few months as we've settled things down is the demand that has started changing. And just for some, some facts here, if January compared to April, we've seen 2,000 more patients a month in April than we did in January at the Grange. And we've seen 5,000 more across the system in April than we did in January. Now, they are at pre-COVID levels and have started exceeding that. But trying to meet that demand increase in such a small space of time and dealing with all of the requirements of testing, social distancing, new pathways has been hugely challenging. You know, over 170 more patients per day accessing our kind of um, assessment and ED systems in April compared to January is, is huge, really. And I think reflects the efforts of the team to try to keep as much of this under control and also seeing a change in presentation. We've seen cardiology numbers like we've never seen. And also some of the non... Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, non-surgery trauma as well. So some real uh, areas where you can understand um, a presenting challenges post lockdown scenarios. I think where some patients have perhaps either sat on their problems or they've uh, not wanted to present 
um, or a less um, or a, le a more fragile now they're starting to to get around more. So and again, urgent primary care have stepped in and set up some primary care centres. We're introducing the one 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 and really huge focus now across the system about trying to get urgent care under control as we go into the next few months. Um, no. Just a couple more workforce covered it earlier. Rhiannon's picked up was significant. Um, the progress on recruitment on the registered nursing is is you know I think it didn't I don't think we all realised how brilliant that was until a few weeks ago when we pulled all of the data together, and the well-being offer as well that we have um, focused on in terms of investing in you know a psychology support counselling. Um, well-being officers to really recognising the pressure staff have been under and also those risk assessments for those pay, the, our staff at risk and needing support um, has also been a key focus. The mass va vaccinations I mentioned but it, I do feel it needs a special mention. We have constantly, we were ready, then the rules changed, the, we've tried to be as agile as possibly, constantly dealing with supply issues, diff offering as many flexible ways of delivering the vaccine as possible in short periods of time. And, and I think the numbers speak for themselves in how well we've done on, on this particular programme. And we know it's not going away and actually the, um, the speed with which we finish this is going to be pretty critical to what we might be dealing with going forward. And then uh, we delivered, as I mentioned, a range of strategic change programmes. We've talked about vascular and mental health today. The breast unit case is progressing well. Tredegan and Newport Wellbeing Centres are progressing well. The radiotherapy satellite unit, as well as a new focus on our annual plan and transformation approach going into the new year. And alongside all that, we delivered on the money, both yeah. in terms of capital and revenue. So that's my kind of some summary and my humbling reflection. You know, it, it wasn't all perfect, but when you pull it all together in a report like that, it really is remarkable that we're all still here smiling today, really. <laughs> and our staff are still in work. So um, so that's my summary and I hope it was useful to um, to read. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Nicola, for a really helpful and honest report, which reflects the huge amount of work and attention to detail that continued to go on despite really dramatically changing circumstances and gives a good analysis of the care that was available and provided to patients over that very difficult part of the year. So thank you very much and congratulations for this. Rhiannon? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I wanted to pick up on, on two areas, one which I think is particularly pertinent just to update the board. Um, we'd received a letter from Welsh Government in relation to the um, ED performance and particularly um, ambulance um, handover delays with a specific focus on patient experience, quality and safety. And a number of directors um, together with some key uh, medical leaders met with Welsh Government colleagues at the middle of last week just to um, well have a walkthrough, um, which was helpful, not just in terms of ED, but also the assessment areas um, and then followed by a, a talk. So walk and talk session. Um, it was a really productive meeting. We felt that Welsh Government were very supportive of our plan um, and clearly the, the board will be updated on that in due course. But there were two areas that Welsh Government offered support. Uh, one was in relation to the flow improvement work um, and how they would trigger Improvement Cymru to work directly with us. And then additionally, um, support for a bid from ourselves into Welsh Government for some additional funding to look at the flow centre model in recognising that we've got quite a a unique approach to the flow centre across an iron bevan so I, I think from our reflections it was a productive meeting one where we were able to show that this isn't about ed it's a whole system approach it's not about ambulance delays on their own either whole system and and the comprehensive as usual, even against an approach of how many patients we can see at one metre versus two metre. So our infection control team, health and safety colleagues are working with the trans outpatient transformation team to look at um, 
the risk assessment, risk assessment versus delays in treatment, particularly for cancer. Um, and, and this was particularly triggered because of our inability to have enough capacity to deal a space.